All right, actually, let me start with, with this. Um, so thanks everyone for, for coming. So today we are going to, we have sort of two sessions planned. We have first session was sort of, sort of as, um, a tutorial of run bio simulations and bio simulators for users. Bio simulators is a registry that we've created of simulation tools. The registry, um, the, the main feature of the registry is a collection of standardized simulation tools, which all provide a consistent interface. And that has enabled us and can enable other people to build applications on top of that. And as one um, example, uh, and partly a, a proof of concept, We've developed on top of this a uh, web application for executing simulations that we call Run Bio Simulation. So this allows you to upload a description of a simulation and a description of a model in the form of a combined archive, select a simulation tool that you'd like to use to execute that, and then receive outputs in a standardized format, which can be connected to visualizations in a standardized way. So we're going to uh, give a, in the first hour to hour and a half, we're going to give a, a, a brief tutorial on this set of resources, mainly focused on the experience to, experience to users. So that will cover how do we create a, a combine archive, how do we create a simulation experiment file inside of that, um, how do we then upload that to run bio simulations, use it to execute a simulation, visualize its results and so on. In the second session, we will focus more on the uh, developer experience for uh, particularly for biosimulators, namely how to contribute an additional simulation tool to biosimulators, how to add additional algorithms to simulation tools that we've already containerized, and how to maintain this going forward, such as how to automate pushing new versions of simulation tools to the biosimulators registry. In that second session, we'll also cover how we're validating simulation tools. So we'll show you the, the test suite that we've created to validate simulation tools, how to execute that test suite either in the cloud or how to run that locally. Um, and we'll also discuss how we're curating simulation tools. Okay, so um, maybe at, at this point, I want to introduce the other people involved in the Biosimulators project. Um, Bilal and, and Jan and Michael, do you wanna introduce yourselves? Oh, and Akil is here as well. Why don't we start with Bilal? Sure. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bilal. I work uh, in Jonathan's lab. Um, my primary uh, work is on building these tools, uh, biosimulators and biosimulations. Jan, Michael, Akil. Hi, this is Akil. Uh, I work at Yukon under Jan. Uh, my primary uh, development was under uh, developing a biosimulator solution and uh, a dispatch module for biosimulators. I am Jan Morrow. <clears throat> Been um, collaborating with uh, Jonathan on uh, the overall design of biosimulators and um, also overseeing the um, HPC infrastructure that does um, the execution of jobs um, that are submitted by the web UI and run biosimulations and the result data storage. Okay, our, our last um, lead developer is Michael Blinoff. 
I'm work. Uh, I'm working with Jan at uh, Virtual Cell team on. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not a lead developer. It's Jonathan. is too kind. I'm just helping with uh, some of the algorithms. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm gonna make a couple announcements and then I'm gonna turn it over to Bilal who's going to uh, give us the first tutorial. Okay, so um, first of all, the, the, the resources that we're gonna talk about today, they're available at biosimulators.org and runbiosimulations.org. There's also both development versions of uh, biosimulators and biosimulations, which are at the same URLs with the, with the dev extension. So as parts of the tutorial, we'll show you some things that uh, haven't yet made it into the production server. And, and those you can see at the, the same URLs by just replacing the .org at the end with .dev. The slides are um, available from a link from the Sketch app for the meeting. We also have a preprint for uh, paper on run by simulations, which is which is currently in bioarchive. Okay, so um, the next thing I, I just want to say before we get started is I want to thank everyone who has contributed. Uh, the main contributors are all here. That you, you, they've already introduced themselves. Um, Bilal Sheikh, uh, Jan Mararu, Michael Blinov. And, um, and Akil. We have been funded generously by the, mainly by the National Institutes of Health through the Center for Reproducible Biomedical Modeling. And a number of people have contributed uh, various pieces to this project. Uh, many people have contributed without even knowing that, um, that we were trying to, to do this. So I just wanna thank everybody who's helped us uh, use simulation tools, contribute to ontologies um, and thank you for uh, giving your time, um, not even knowing that, that you're necessarily contributing to a specific project. So we um, we're really welcome to, or we, we welcome people to, to work with us. Um, if you'd like to uh, use biosimulations or contribute something or have feedback, uh, we invite you to, to submit uh, feedback to us either through GitHub issues, that would be the, the recommended way to provide feedback, or you can also email us at info at um, If you'd really like to get involved, we also meet uh, Thursdays at, um, actually we now meet at Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so our schedule for the week is today we have tutorials as I Two tutorials, as I mentioned, we'll start by focusing on users and then um, at, in, at a roughly 75 minutes, we'll switch to focusing on the developer experience, how to contribute simulation tools. What we have planned for tomorrow and, and the rest of the week is to work together with um, anyone in the community who would like to either use biosimulators or run biosimulations or contribute to it and we'll share some ideas of what that could look like. Um, and of course, we, we can find other times to, to work with people beyond uh, this particular week. And then on Friday, we've scheduled a forum to discuss future directions and feedback on run biosimulations and biosimulators. So to, to inspire some thinking about potential hackers on the project, um, there's a number of things that we could potentially do. Uh, we could work together to add additional tools to the registry. We can curate their capabilities, turn them into standardized Docker images. Uh, we could potentially, if there's anyone here who maintains a model repository, we could start to work on how to integrate run by simulations with model repositories. Uh, additional apps could potentially be developed on top of the platform. Uh, one thing that um, some people might like would be a Jupyter Notebook interface where simulations could be run uh, through a Jupyter Notebook instead of through the, the web app that we've created. 
uh, we could try to create tools for recommending simulation algorithms and tools that are able to execute a particular model. Uh, we started to work on uh, data visualizations and we'll share that, but uh, additional visualizations could be added. Um, and of course, we can work on refining the core capabilities. So um, to facilitate discussion for the, the hackathon portion of the meeting, we have set up a discussion forum on GitHub, and we've also created a Slack channel within the or a, a Slack um, tag within the, the Slack channel for the combine meeting. Okay, uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Bilal, who's going to give the first tutorial. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, that's the wrong uh, screen there. While ball, ball is getting set up, I just want to invite everyone to ask questions throughout the, the meeting. Uh, we're a pretty small group. Uh, we've tried to allocate enough time so that uh, we can entertain questions. Yeah. All right. I can uh, start it here. So I just wanted to give a, a tutorial on how to use uh, both run bio simulations and uh, bio simulators. Um, so the, the basic workflow is that we assemble a uh, project, um, a combine archive. Uh, this would contain a setML file as well as the, the model. Um, and this can then be executed either online through run bio simulations, or one can use bio simulators to find other software tools uh, that can then be um, executed locally on their own computer um, via Docker. Uh, so for example, if we open up um, JWS, they have a uh, method here from which we can create a uh, combine archive um, by selecting a model and, and providing the information. Uh, I'm going to use one that's uh, already sort of pre-filled out. Um, but what we would do is you know, fill out this information here, uh, go down and select a model. Um, and in the simulation tasks, uh, we would you know put in the uh, parameters that we are looking to use in our simulation, um, as well as the final report that we um, are looking for. So from here, we can then go ahead and download this combined archive. Uh, and we would now have it uh, saved um, in our uh, local directory. Uh, from that point, we can actually now if we go to the run.biosimulations.org, uh, um, click on the run a simulation up here on the top, we can now run these simulations. So I'm going to go ahead and upload the file um, that we just to create it. Uh, we can select a simulation tool for th that we want to use. So I'll pick Tellurium uh, version of the tool, and we can give it a name. And go ahead and click. Run. Um, so this has now been submitted. We can see from this message here. Um, and we can go ahead and monitor the status of this uh, at this page. Now, if we have a longer running simulation, um, we could have entered our email on the last page. Uh, and then instead of sitting here watching this, we could have gotten a, a we would get a notification when the simulation has either finished uh, or failed. So now we see that the simulation has, has run. Um, and we can take a look at, for example, at the log output. Uh, so here we can see that you know there was one set ML document which had one simulation in it. It successfully uh, completed it, um, and we can also look look at the raw output um, of the process and that's on Yukon's HPC and see what was going on. So we can see that it downloaded the combine archive, uh, it pulled a Docker image, uh, ran the simulator in that image, etc. So the interesting portions here are when you come here to design uh, a chart. We can select the reports that were generated from this um, from this uh, simulation and select also the, the data output. And from there, we can actually view a visualization of this, uh, this output. So in this case, you know, I selected, I think these are material populations. Um, and we can we can graph these and, and see um, you know, an overview of the results. Uh, we can also click on this link here to download all of the outputs. 
so this would include the log as well as um, all the data in an HDF file. Um, and you can you know, download the original uh, combine archive as well. So you'll see here that there is a, a link. Um, actually, let me, let me uh, demonstrate one other simulation first. Um, so here I'm going to upload uh, an omics archive that contains a um, flex balance model of E. coli metabolism. And I'm going to select, I believe it is Cobra Pi that handles this one. Um, and when I run this, um, we'll actually be able to see a uh, new feature that we have been working on um, to do custom visualization rather than just the uh, line plot that we saw earlier. So let's let this run for a couple of seconds. Should be fast. Yep. Um, and now when here, when we go to design chart, I'm actually going to select Vega visualization. So uh, Vega, Vega is a declarative grammar for visualizations. Um, and this allows the use of uh, consistent um, declaration files that can then be painted with data. Um, really helps with reproducibility as well as making complex visualizations and using them in, in various use cases. Um, so here I will select a visualization that we have previously created, um, which is based on the FBA Escher package. Um, Jonathan was able to convert that over uh, to the Vega specification. And here I will select uh, which, which data from the simulation that I just ran, I want to map to the inputs. And when I visualize here, I can now see the uh, pathway that was, was run um, along with, so this is, yeah, we can see over here, we have the, the fluxes. Um, I think this is somewhat resolution dependent. Uh, we have to work that out. But here we can see a uh, you know, axis that shows us the, the various fluxes um, through the entire metabolism. And this is, can be interactive where we can you know, hover over certain portions of this um, to isolate certain reactions, um, hover over metabolites, for example, to isolate the pathways that they are involved in. And the, the key feature is you know, that this is really painted with the data of the simulation that I just ran. Um, so if I were to change the omics file slightly, we might see a little bit of a different coloring here, uh, depending on which fluxes were, were changed. So if I go back um, to the, so here I can show um, you know, a list of all the simulations that I have run. Uh, this is essentially gonna be stored onto your local um, browser storage. Uh, and you are given from here the ability to um, filter uh, based on various columns. Um, you can search based on, for example, the simulator that was used, uh, the various frameworks that are, um, involved in the simulation, et cetera. Um, and uh, this, you know, all, each of these simulations is essentially uh, a, a unique URL. Um, and then this URL can be shared um, to any collaborators uh, so that they can easily view the results as well. Um, yeah, so this is the quick sort of crash course overview of what the, the Run Bio Simulations platform is. Um, and from here, I can show the underlying technology that we've developed that actually makes this possible. So if we go back to the um, first demo that I ran, you can see here that the simulator that I chose was Tellurium. Um, if I actually click on this, this is a link to our biosimulators uh, database, where you can get the information about each of these uh, simulation tools. Um, so here, you know, you can see the citation for, for Tellurium, um, as well as a some interfaces here, uh, information, sorry, here that such as the interfaces that it runs on, uh, what programming language it's created in, et cetera. Um, one of the, the main features of this is the algorithm section. Uh, over here, we list out all of the different algorithms that are supported by the simulator. So if you remember when I generated the combine um, archive, I chose uh, Kisau 19, uh, which is just CVOD, uh, to be the algorithm that was used for the simulation. And we have a characterization of that, as well as all the parameters that are supported by the, um, by the image. Um, and all of, these, all of this information is curated uh, for the various simulators through automated testing, which I will uh, show in a little bit. Um, over here, we can see the you know, 
various versions that are available. Uh, all this is the same information just uh, presented in, in JSON. Um, and most importantly here, we are able to get a URL uh, for the biosimulator's uh, image. So I can actually just hit this button and I've now copied um, that command to my clipboard. So from here, I can actually now run this uh, on my own local machine. So first thing, for example, I can just go ahead and, and pull uh, the information. I've already pulled this image, so it's going to be a bit fast here. Um, it, it would take a little bit more time otherwise. Um, so in this folder, I have uh, the um, combine archive that we executed on the cloud. Um, now I can go ahead and show how this would work uh, locally. So what I am doing here is, uh, you can see my mouse, hopefully. I, if I can make it a little. So uh, this is just the standard Docker run command. Um, I'm running this interactively. Uh, and the key here is the, the mount, um, the volume mount command. So essentially, this is the directory that I'm in. I am mounting that to a any arbitrary directory on the container. Um, and the two real main uh, inputs to these containers are the uh, combine archive, which is the input, and where I want these results to be output. Um, and from this command, I can then go ahead and hit enter. And we shall soon see, yep, that the simulation runs. Um, if I now look at the directory, I have a new output folder. And in that output folder, we can see that I've you know, produced a HDF file um, with the, the, the report as well as the log. And you'll see that this log um, will be very similar to the one that we saw in the cloud, except it's going to be missing the information about downloading the archive, et cetera, because it's, it's running locally. So to give a little bit more information about what these simulation images actually are, uh, we can skip uh, over here for just a second. Yeah, so, so the, the key um, feature that we have been trying to work on with the, the biosimulators is getting these uh, into um, standardized formats uh, that can then be uh, run quite easily. So each of these simulation tools will have um, a different interface, for example, different uh, commands and algorithms. And we want to make it very easy to be able to put this all into um, sort of a, a unified interface. So, uh, so essentially, for all the different um, simulation tools, we've uploaded them to the Docker Hub container registry uh, to enable users to be able to download, for example, a specific simulation tool at a specific version um, and you know, maintain, these ver maintain these images online so that these versions can be uh, downloaded again in the future and you know, in order to enhance reproducibility. Um, another thing that we wanted to um, work on is the ability to, when you select a simulator, provide the same sort of input uh, options um, to every different tool. This way, you don't have to be worrying about uh, what is the input again for vCell, how does Tellurium work again, which formats do they all require. Uh, this really makes it easy to be able to reproduce um, results. So for example, if I go back to uh, my terminal here, um, and I can try and, let's see, run. Here is vCell. Okay, so here, for example, is Kopasi, um, and I'm going to run it on this Omex archive that I've uh, gotten from Biomodels. If I go ahead and run this, you'll see that this one actually doesn't work. Um, based on these results, I can see that, oh, okay, Kopasi doesn't support this, this algorithm. How can I, you know, let me see, maybe Tellurium will work. Uh, that might be a way that I can get the results that I'm seeking. And I don't really have to change anything here other than just the name. Um, I don't have to worry about what the interface is, how it's, uh, how does Tellurium work differently compared to Kapazi. Um, simply by changing the name, I am then able to run this simulation. Uh, oh, I've already run it, so the output is already exists here. Sorry, uh, let me just.
uh, perils of doing live demos. OK, um, so now when I run this with the Tellurium, uh, we should be able to see that it will go ahead and execute this correctly. And the output has now been saved in that directory that I just deleted. Um, so this really you know, gives you the ability to experiment and try different simulation tools without any overhead. All that I really had to do was change the name of the simulator um, that I was using. So that we think this is you know, a really powerful feature to help with uh, reducing the barrier to, to really getting started with modeling and comparing these, these different tools. So the way that we are um, planning to uh, build upon this is just to really be able to create an ecosystem of tools. So what I was you know, just demonstrating is um, we start with common formats for simulators and inputs. Um, so the Combine uh, archive, for example, is you know, well used in the community. Um, the HDF5 uh, file format is used across the sciences for data outputs. So we've chosen to go with that one. Um, the logs have all been uh, output in a structured manner so that we can produce those um, sort of visualizations of the logs that we were seeing earlier. Um, and we're, you know, also standardizing the simulators themselves as well as capturing their um, capabilities and, and test uh, suite information. Um, and all of this is essentially uh, run through a GitHub um, actions workflow to, to validate each container and ensure that it works properly. Um, so this test suite runs um, when a simulator uh, simulation tool author submits uh, a, issues a comment essentially on one of uh, the pages. It will run automatically, run these tests, and let the author of the simulation tool know what parts worked, what parts didn't. Um, so so far we've you know built the the following, um, and these are some. Uh, simulators as well that we can um, hopefully work on. So one thing I, I skipped over was actually the validation of these tools. So if I go here and um, look at all the, the simulators that are available, um, I can click on any of these and uh, view the results of the, the testing that I was just describing. Um, so we can go, for example, let me find uh, Tellurium since I've been using that one. We'll, we'll use vSAL here instead. Um, so for example, we can go to the, oh, vSAL does not yet have that, my bad. Um, if we well, go you, here to, sorry, was that? No, this is fine. The, yeah. This will demonstrate the same thing. Yeah, I know we have a bit of a variation in, in the capabilities of these. So um, this, for example, is the Gillis by 2, um, high Gillis by 2 simulator. Uh, so what we do is uh, have these tests for all the various aspects of the standard that we are working with. So this is essentially you know, test for the CLI to make sure that you know, the simulator can be run uh, in the way that we want, where all you have to do is provide the Docker image and input and output, um, and it can go ahead and, and run the simulator. Um, over here, we are also you know, testing the uh, various, the support of various SetML features. Um, so this is generally on um, level one version three uh, to try and get most of the tools um, supporting the majority of, of that a set ML standard. Um, and we can see the, uh, the test that we run, uh, whether or not the test passed. Uh, here is the output. Um, and based on this, we um, can ensure that the, the image is working. Uh, so over here, you'll see that these are actually linked to the GitHub issues and GitHub actions. So if I click on this here, we can see that this was uh, the workflow that was triggered when we wanted to add uh, this container to the registry. Um, so this, we would, you know, post a, an issue. Uh, this would then go ahead and check and make sure the specifications are valid. Uh, it would go ahead and run the various tests, uh, specify why, you know, certain tests were passed, why they were skipped. Um, and we can actually take a look at the GitHub um, action that actually ran. So we can see that this was all happening automatically through the GitHub Actions framework, where it 
was able to create a job, uh, install Python on a container, for example. Um, over here, we're installing Singularity. Uh, here actually is where our um, tests are running. So here we are. Um, so we can see that you know these are the various tests that were being run. Um, so this was all happening on the cloud. If someone wanted to submit a uh, simulator to the registry, um, but one could also download this Python package and uh, use it locally to test um, against local copies of a simulator that they're hoping to, to submit, for example. So, um, yeah, so moving forward, uh, we can talk a little bit about the uh, roadmap, let me just get my station running again. Um, so the first part of this was to really create the, the various formats and, and the platform. Um, so we can see that with the specifications that we've uh, been working on for the containers, uh, the database that we've set up, as well as the API and web application. Um, then we are working on containerizing uh, simulators. So we have worked on uh, for example, the, the simulators, Copasi, Teloria, vCell have all been containerized, uh, and we have one um, sort of version for each of those that's now available uh, to use. Um, and now this is really the stage where we're inviting community participation. Um, so we're asking you know, for all of you for, for feedback, uh, if there's any input that you have uh, about the formats that we've chosen, if there's any additional information that we should be recording, for example, um, if there's any bugs in the web application or anything that could be explained better, made easier. Um, and from there, we're going to be looking to containerize more simulators. Uh, hopefully, this will be with the cooperation of the authors of these tools. Um, and Jonathan will be hosting the next tutorial session on how one would actually go and create uh, a biosimulators compatible version of their simulation tool. Um, and as this continues to grow, hopefully we will be uh, able to run larger models and simulations. Um, and one thing that we have actually started on is uh, biosimulations, which is going to be a platform for uh, sharing entire studies. Um, so you would have a model, uh, several different simulations, several different visualizations and outputs, all sort of packaged together in a you know curated project uh, that their authors can then share uh, with journals, journals can share with their readers, et cetera. Um, yeah, so like I had mentioned, uh, immediately after this, that would, uh, Jonathan's going to be giving a tutorial on, sorry. Oh, was that just the recording stopping? Oh, my bad. Um, yeah, so Jonathan would be giving a tutorial on um, actually creating uh, new simulation tools. Um, and for the rest of the week, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be having participation in, in the hackathon where we can go ahead and try and create new simulation tools or run simulations uh, via the API instead of using the web app to you know, get a variety of studies, et cetera. Um, and you know, on Friday, hopefully we'll have another open forum where we can get uh, feedback in, in future directions. Um, so Jonathan has, has gone through this, but, and if anyone is interested in, in participating in any of these uh, and, and communicate, uh, sorry, working on any of these tools with us, um, feel free to file GitHub issues uh, or uh, join one of our meetings um, with any ideas that you might have. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, if anyone wants to see me run a certain workflow again or demonstrate a certain feature again, um, please ask. Could you go to um, to back to biosimulators.org and show the the list of available simulation algorithms? I think one thing to um, uh, to maybe point out is so Bilal started this example by showing how you could start from JWS online, create a simulation experiment, and 
that simulation experiment um, with some limitations can be run in, in DJWS online. Um, so I think the one of the key things here is that there are many more simulation algorithms which are all available from one place. And the and then we are using that to provide a web application for for accessing all of these simulation algorithms. And all of this is then also available with the all of the features of SetML, including repeated tasks. Um, so that, that contrasts to, to JWS online where uh, I believe there's only one simulation algorithm which is provided. And, and so even though, um, well, yeah. So this encompasses flux balance, uh, flux balance simulation methods, logical simulation methods, stochastic simulation methods. Um, with Jan, we're working on bringing spatial simulation methods into this as well with B-cell. Um, in principle, there's really no limit to the, the diversity of simulation methods that we can all that we can bring in, into one place um, using the, the formats and abstractions that we've developed here. Yeah, so looking at this view, for example, just you know the quite a few different algorithms um, that are represented across these uh, various simulation um, tools. Uh, so from that, you can really, if you're looking to run some particular algorithm, uh, click on them and, and filter and see, okay, this is the image. Um, so this is actually an example of an image where we don't yet have a, the, sorry, of a simulator where we don't yet have an um, image. So this would be a great project if anyone wants to, to get involved. Um, but based on uh, what you filter here, you can really take a look at, okay, these are the um, simulators that support the algorithm I'm interested in. Here are the ones that have an image and I can go ahead and click on this and you know run it through uh, run by simulations. Can you scroll down and show the model formats as well? Yes. So another option is uh, here to filter through various model formats. Um, so you know the majority of our simulators uh, work with SPML, uh, but there are also um, we have created a container for one so far uh, that works with uh, BNGL, so that's BioNetGen. Um, and the hope is that, you know, since these are just Docker containers, they can be plugged right into the system um, and we'll have, you know, containers as well for these other, other model formats. Within SPML, we have examples of containers that support the SPML FPC package, the SPML qual package, uh, Chris Meyer's group is working on getting a container uh, contributed, which and that will support um, SPML FPC, SPML comp, um, and, and some other combinations of SPML packages. So none of this is, uh, or, or all of this is designed, uh, not only to to be able to capture, in, in principle, any simulation algorithm, but it, it's also designed to be able to capture any model format, any model framework. Are there any questions for Bilal? All right, uh, then um, uh, I guess Bilal and I and some of the other developers can stick around if for the next 45 minutes if there are any questions that, that people want to ask or things that, that you'd like to discuss with us. 
otherwise we'll um, hopefully see you back in 45 minutes to dig deeper into the specific formats that we're working with and exactly how we can work together to to containerize and contribute additional simulation tools to biosimulators, and then make that available through the web application that we've created. So out of curiosity, is anyone here working on simulation tools? Um, trying to look at, see if I recognize any here. Um, Matthias König here. Um, yeah, I'm uh, working on a uh, simulator on top of uh, Roadrunner. It's called SPML Sim. Um, it has a bit of um, SetML support. And yeah, this would definitely be a tool uh, on top. Otherwise, I'm contributed to yeah, uh, Roadrunner, Copa Pi, but your Tellurium, you have these already uh, in, in there. So yeah. Um, but yeah, this could be definitely interesting uh, um, um, to dockerize that and uh, contribute that. Yeah, so I mean, um... If, as long as it can be created into a Docker image, it can be plugged in here, and people can use your, you know, simulator on the on the uh, biosimulations web app. So definitely stick around for the next tutorial uh, where we can walk through essentially how that is done. Um, I do. Quick question about resources. Um, what what resources can be used by this uh, simulations? How many cores? How much RAM? Um, if I provide a simulator with uh, which provides um, um, parallelization um, capabilities, um, things like um, could be running Kubernetes and so on. Um, could this? Yeah, so I mean, uh, Jan can definitely uh, touch on this a little bit more. The The way that it's currently set up, uh, it is being run on Yukon's HPC. Um, the job script that I've written to run these just happens right now to use just one core. Uh, but that can definitely be expanded if the uh, tool supports parallelization. Um, I don't think anything that we have been running so far does. So we haven't uh, moved into that direction. Um, but that would be something that we could do. Uh, Jan, do you want to, to comment a little bit more on that? Sorry, I was muted. <clears throat> um, I did not catch the original question about running parallel. Uh, essentially, like if there are simulators that can take advantage of parallel architectures or can be, um, you said run on, on Kubernetes? Is that through like a, a workflow yeah, yeah, yeah. that will create? Or let's containers? say, like in the or in the first version, they just like use multiple cores. As far as I know, GitHub Actions and so on, most of the time they only have a, a single core. But um, normally, if you have like some Docker based workflows, you can assign resources to your um, containers. And um, okay. if you could assign like multiple cores and things like that, so that the uh, um, software. Oh, yeah, that's. That. Yeah, that, I see. I see. That's so, so Kubernetes was the example of like the orchestrator. For a second, I, I thought there was a simulator no. built on. That sort of uh, no, the, yeah, the is. simulator is is simulator would support Kubernetes, but it's I think it's not the workflow you you're looking for. Right. Here it's more like okay, I have something which can run in parallel, and um, just a single Docker container should use more than one core. This would be the mm -hmm. simple thing, and would be nice if this would. Be yeah, so at least from the the development point of view, um, I could definitely you know make the changes to have uh, the container um, request multiple cores, uh, and then Jan can talk more about sort of what the limitations of that would be, if any, and how that would work on the HPC end. So one thing um, I maybe would be helpful to clarify. So GitHub Actions are only being used to validate simulation tools. We're not using GitHub Actions to execute simulations. So when you upload a simulation experiment to run by the simulations, that will get run on a a cluster at the University of Connecticut, which Jan's team manages. And as Balala mentioned, we could easily assign more resources to individual jobs. So you don't currently have an option, but it wouldn't be hard for us to, to change that. The harder part, of course, is individual simulation tools have to take advantage of that. Uh, another thing that we could in general do in, in most cases is you know, as, as you know, you know, simulation experiments are largely composed, or in many cases, are composed of independent tasks. And uh, essentially, this could be this; those tasks could be executed in parallel. It's not currently being done, but um, 
for most of the simulation tools, it, it wouldn't be that hard for us to turn it into a set of tasks which are executed in parallel rather than in series. Oh. Yeah, I, I think also like most of the simulations are pretty fast, like with current SBML models. I think more about things like uh, parameter uh, optimization and so on, which probably you don't really want to run on one core or so. <laughs> uh, or yeah, uh, things like that. And I could imagine like parameter fitting could be also a nice thing um, to, to execute here in this environment. Yeah, so, so Daniel is, is here. Um, and we reached out to PE Tab to explore uh, how to maybe take advantage of some of the things that we've created to help keep track of parameter estimation tools, their capabilities, provide them in a more standardized interface. And then if we were able to, to package them up, um, I know, you know that some of them use MATLAB within it, so that runs into some licensing issues, issues that we'd have to navigate if we wanted to make those accessible through a web interface. Um, but in, in any case, in, in principle, this is essentially just a, an, ex, an environment for executing comment archives. And the details of how those are processed are abstracted into the Docker images. And so through that, we can create Docker images that run different methods. They don't need to all be forward simulation methods. The parameter estimation and other analyses can be included. We have a small number of examples of this already. Uh, of algorithms which are not forward simulation methods, but th this is one area that we would like to expand into. So that, that comes up a lot with uh, logical simulation as well. There's a lot of methods for analyzing the structure of models. This can all be, I think, encompassed into this paradigm. Yeah, I, I would definitely be really interested in uh, 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 trying to to bring my uh, simulator in this uh, in this uh, framework. It also would force me like to have a more standardized input output uh, interface, which probably would also be good for for me or my tool. Um, so yeah, um, definitely, I'm looking forward to to hear more about how how to how to do that. Yeah, so, so one thing that um, would likely come up is that um, this will force a lot of standardization, particularly on ZML and, and also the, the usage of Castal in conjunction with ZML. Um, so we have already, I, I think in your case, because um, SBML SIM is in Python, it would be, and most of the things that we've developed or the, the resources that we've developed to build these containers, it's all based in Python. So for Python based tools, turning them into something with a more standardized interface um, is quite quick, especially if they already support ZML, then it's really just a matter of maybe ironing out some of the inconsistencies in exactly how they support ZML as, as that deviates from other tools. And, and then adding a command line interface, which is really easy and putting it in a Docker image, again, very easy. So, you know, for SPML SIM, I mean, I think, you know, we'd probably be looking at like less than a day of work to, to get this working. If there's no, you know, ZML support and, and there's no like clear curation of what the methods are and so on, like that'll <laughs> yeah, take more much time. More. Um, then we have to work on probably creating new CASAL terms and um, mapping <laughs> CASAL terms to methods and, for me, it's more like uh, okay. We how how has the um, oh, this command line interface to look like that you can work? Uh, okay, and um, are there any restrictions on the Docker containers and so on? And more like technical issues, uh, smaller technical issues. But I don't think this is a, a, a lot of work to do. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for SPML sim, we're really probably looking at just like a few hours I mean, if we did it together. Um, but I mean, as, as we can you know, show in the, in the next hour, um, most of the, so even for tools like uh, Glad, uh, we'll all show an example of GlassPy2. So if we take that as an example, GlassPy2, it's a program which can execute SBML, uh, but it has no support for, for ZML. Uh, so we can add support for ZML and Combine and Casao and HDF, all of this. 
um, essentially what each of the um, each of the containers essentially right now has a Python package inside it, which implements the command line interface. And that command line interface is created by mixing two things. One is a, a simulation package like GlazPy2. And then the second is a set of utilities that we've written for executing common archives and sediment and common archives and collecting the logs and collecting the results. And the two can be combined together with just a few hundred lines of code. And then tools which already have, you know, SetML and, and map Casal to methods and so on, then you need even less code. But even for the ones where there's no SetML, uh, it doesn't require a ton of work. We've tried very carefully to make sure that the, the barrier entry to, is, is low to add new simulation tools. One thing that you will probably you know, astutely recognize is because of the, the way that we're mapping um, Docker images to the underlying simulation tool is through entry points. Um, this, it's, it, we've done it this way because I think this is the simplest way for developers to support, but it does, the way that this is structured, the containers are not really intended to be used like a service where you keep querying the container to run other task. Um, instead, then this is sort of inherited from the design of SetML. The idea is that the whole workflow is sort of designed and described in SetML. And then the simulation program knows how to interpret that workflow. Um, but anyway, it, it need not all be structured this way, but we, we could design the containers in a slightly different way, which would be more conducive to running as a service. But this would, I think, be more, the advantage is that it would be higher performance for certain applications like you're describing. The downside is it would likely require more work to support this. And it would also, I think, be less consistent with the spirit of SetML as the language for describing the workflow. Yeah, sounds sounds all reasonable. Um, yeah, for me it's all that. like I, I have to say like, with this um, whole simulation thing. Uh, most of the time, you, you it's much better to be pragmatic and keep it simple. That's often why like okay, you want your simulator in C plus plus in the end, but all the wrapping around Python is fast enough for most of the things, and it's more like develop meant time of the this whole services than actually executing the things because most is so, so most is so fast that you you seldom have to wait like for more than a few minutes in the in the worst case so um. yeah so, so this is all really designed from that perspective as we want the development time to be low and there is some of course sacrifice in performance that that comes from that um our thinking was if we can get a bunch of the community to support this, we can always think about a, a higher performance version in the future. And we can perhaps at that point, you know, come up with some clever way to migrate tools forward, which doesn't require a lot of work on the part of most developers. Yeah, and I think that's one of the big advantages of, of Docker um, is, you know, if we do come up with a better way in the future, it's just another Docker image that can plug right in. Uh, that doesn't mean that the older ones will stop working uh, as long as they have that same interface. So it, it leaves a lot of room for upgrades um, and, and incremental changes. And um, how would you execute this in the end? Is there an API which you could just call? Or um, for me, well, or is, is the idea like that you execute it locally or on your cluster by, by pulling the containers? In, like basically if you have in the end like a few, uh, few favorite simulators you want to run uh, and use, and um, I don't know, would you use an API for that? Or, uh, okay. So I think as you know, as Blal is going to show, there's a few options. We show yeah. the web application. Blal showed how you can pull the Docker images. And there is another option, which is what Blal is going to show here. Right. So the the web application that I uh, was showing previously. So if you go to uh, 
if you go, you know, this way, uh, you fill out this form, all it's really doing is calling this API in the, in the backend. Uh, so if you are a developer, you can just go ahead and call this on your own. Um, so over here for a simulation run, um, you would essentially, if I try this out here, uh, you could choose a uh, omics file here um, and get this so we can try it out. Uh, Um, don't remember what the latest version of that is. 2.2.0. There we go. I think we you can also type latest. Yeah, I, I do think that works, but just to be sure, because we don't um, have that on the web app. Um, and from here, you can uh, choose a file. So, convenient one. That was correct. Yep, there we go. So this has now been submitted, um, and it's now running in the, in the back end. Uh, and here is, you know, the curl command that you could have used instead. And obviously, you can translate this to, to any language you, if you're interested. In. Um, and then once we are given this response uh, with this ID, um, you can then go ahead and oops, uh, call this endpoint uh, and be able to actually view the. Just view the, the status so we now see if hey, it succeeded. Uh, and from there, you can go ahead and then pull the results um, following the same, same principle. So we have the ID. Um, this one will take a while on the interface because the interface will get overwhelmed by the, the results. Um, but doing this through curl or something, you should be able to just download it uh, straight into a file. Yeah, I should have thought about that before I hit execute on this one. The, the front end cannot handle the, the size of the results, obviously. Oh, actually, it's not bad. Yeah, so here is your the simulation. Um, this is each of the different reports. And then, you know, you have the, the raw results down here. So, but if you had done this through curl, uh, you would have been able to just download this very quickly. Yeah. So th this endpoint returns the results in a JSON format. So that's conducive to the visualization that we're using with Plotly and, and Vega, but um, the, the download endpoint will return the results in HDF. And so that's much smaller. And another cool thing which Bilal is working on setting up here is, so we've built um, as part of this a database of simulation results. And Bilal is right now setting up the ability to not only retrieve the entire simulation results, but to retrieve slices of the simulation results. So if you had like a large number of simulations and you just want to get out a couple of variables, um, it will be possible to slice that out without reading a large, or without reading an entire large file of simulation results. Yeah, and just to add on, so this would be the, the download endpoint. Um, I think the front end is probably still too slow to process it, but uh, this would let you download the HDF file um, of all the results. Yeah, and we can also slowly work its way through it. Mention that, that yeah, it... this page is it's not really designed to, to use this. Oh, here it is. You can now click here to, to download the HDF file. Uh, this is more just like interactive documentation that's uh, generated from the specification automatically so yeah, yeah. no worries i know i know this uh, stuff but oh, uh yeah. <laughs> it was just to uh okay no uh, it was more like generally yeah, okay i see you have the right endpoints and you can query yep. it and it makes sense and yeah just, so uh, hopefully the long running sim uh, no, uh, yeah go, so hopefully go. they should be well organized enough to follow along um yeah, what the it's, workflow it's is uh, but yeah can you show also one of the pip packages so there's one of the there's pip packages Oh, for yeah. yeah, so there is a fourth option, um, which is to download the, the Python packages, which are provide the command line programs. Yeah, so uh, we've created Docker containers for all of these, but the Docker containers are essentially wrapping this, this Python package. Um, so if you want to work in Python directly, you can actually just go ahead and install this pip package, uh, and this will it will still have this the same interface, but it'll be running uh, on your machine rather than in an Docker container. And right now, um, so you know, again, we're trying uh, to keep is Java based, for example. So that's not. Oh, uh, I see this brushed. 
So one other thing I can. Can you still see the share? Or yeah, we can see the share. So one other thing I can mention about these uh, Python packages. So from the developer standpoint, you know, we're trying to keep it simple and only um, require consistency really at the level of the Docker image. But in, in actuality, for almost all of the, the simulators that we have created so far, there's actually much more consistency beyond that down to the level of Python functions. And um, we don't really want to, we want to be careful not to enforce that because, uh, well, for one, like we don't need to, we don't want to say that everything has to be developed in Python. But for nine out of the 10 that we have, um, they all have a standard, well, all 10 have a standard command line interface. And for nine out of 10, that standard command line interface is just mapped to two Python functions, which also behave exactly the same way. So those are functions for executing a common archive or executing a set ML document. So if, if someone wanted to compose simulation tools together, then at least the, the subset of, uh, of the tools which provide these uh, Python, essentially like a standardized Python API, gives you much more flexibility to compose simulation tools together. But I think we're probably going to be hesitant to try to push that level of standardization on the whole community because it, I think it's a bit overly constraining. Um, may I ask a question? Yeah, I wonder um, when you have large number simulation and uh, how you save individual uh, simulation result and also if, for example, when you do some parameter scan, try to combine to visit all the simulated simulation result across different um, kind of the individual result, how those things be handled? Uh, so those are features that we are um, anticipating to add uh, in a more full featured platform. Uh, so this is sort of the building block for uh, a more um, complicated application on top. Uh, one of the things that we can actually discuss in the uh, hackathon is going to be how can the API be used to build uh, you know, apps on top of. So this would be a great example of what the, you know, some program would have to do is call the API several times for several different simulations, retrieve their results, and then do the sort of scan that uh, you're talking about um, and present that to the user. So this was a, you know, an example of something that we can work on during the hackathon or, or discuss during the hackathon. Um, but we are planning on building a layer on top of this that will provide more. Um, uh, so this would be sort of the, the level uh, that we currently have is at the level of like an individual simulation. Um, and then we're planning on building a platform that allows for the share and uh, visualization, for example, of like an entire study. So that would be multiple simulations tied together um, and the output, uh, you know, uh, drawing from multiple runs in, in some way. So that's our next step. So um, we're, even with the current platform, actually, so, a single set ML file can describe really arbitrarily many uh, individual simulation runs. And then that can be within set ML, you can control how the results get concatenated into a single report, which would be a, a single data set within an HDF5 file. So um, you can use this to encode arbitrarily many simulations into a single uh, table. Then on top of that, there's another abstraction in SetML, which, which we already support, um, which are repeated tasks. So if you wanted to describe a parameter scan where you execute a, a simulation many times with different values of one or more parameters, that can be described in SetML as a repeated task. It would be a repeated task over an iteration. It's sort of like a for loop. 
you know, can roughly think of it like a for loop. Um, and then those results will get concatenated into a multi-dimensional matrix and saved to an HDFI file. So we'll, what you'll end up with is there'll be an axis of the HDF file, which corresponds to each of the iterations within the repeated task. So if you wanted to ex ex like explore as, along a certain dimension of um, a parameter scan, that will be organized as the dimension in the HDF. So all of this is already supported. On, and then as Bilal mentioned, on top of that, we are planning to add yet more abstraction. I think part of the path forward to adding more abstraction is to expand the capabilities of SetML. So SetML, as I mentioned, has repeated tasks, but there are some limits to what you can do with them. Um, but through conversation with the SetML community over time, uh, I think the capabilities of SetML could be expanded to allow a greater set of um, uh, 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 encoding a, a greater range of repeated tasks. Right now you, you could do it, but you would have to sort of flatten out the structure of the set of simulation experiments that you want to run, encode all of that into SetML, all this will work fine. You'll just end up with a result document, which is like flattened out. So if you want results, which kind of keep the, the organization of the parameter scan that you want with like a nested set of for loops corresponding to iteration over different dimensions, um, the repeated task will do that with the caveat that there are some limitations to what SetML allows. Yeah, I guess we have the similar kind of uh, challenge. So we try to uh, do the part of computing and to kind of take advantage of uh, more resources for the computation. Uh, in the same time, when we have simulation result back, because we distribute the simulation to the different computer, different cores, um, when you do the data analysis, sometimes you want to interactively to, um, to query the result data is not only the raw data, just one time analysis. Um, our challenge we, we face similarly is when we change certain filter condition to get different way to visualize or query the data, uh, the performance, the communication, especially with the network communication is a challenge. So that's, that's a big reason for, um, big motivation for what Bilal has been working on the last few weeks is to enable processing on top of data sets to be done uh, on the server. And then just the reduced data would be streamed back to the client. And, and all of this is, I mean, so when you design a simulation or a set ML document, as the designer of that, you can decide what outputs that you would like to record. And it's up to you whether you want to already reduce some of the results in SetML, or you just want to record all the outputs to allow exploration of the data later. So uh, this is all designed to support either mode, but we it's really motivated by the latter. We, we like uh, modelers to just record everything. And then you can, after the fact, you decide what you want to interactively analyze. And to particularly for large data sets, um, the data set will get stored in the cloud. And then Bilal, as, as you know, we've mentioned, is building something which will make it possible to query pieces of this out quickly and do reductions on top of that. Yeah, I, I guess in this, <clears throat> really the balance is kind of more uh, research specific or model uh, specific and for two just provide certain flexibility so the modeler can choose what kind of data they want to save or, or they want to re revisit later to provide certain flexibility because sometimes 
for us, we have simulation sometimes run even weeks. And so even we kind of get rid of a certain parameter early and maybe it's kind of expensive to have to rerun things again. Right, this is all very much designed, even though all the examples right now are drawn from short models, it's all very much designed really around long simulations. That's why we yeah. store things as opposed to um, the running simulations in a browser. Uh, this is why we've embraced Docker because we, we want you to be able to bring arbitrarily complex simulation algorithms that are implemented in you know, whatever programming language you want. Um, it's, this is very much designed differently than, than other things like JDBS Online where the simulations can only be run with like one or two algorithms and they essentially have to be short. This doesn't have these limitations. Um, and there is a lot of flexibility you know, built in as, as we discussed. Um, so what gets recorded is that's up to the modeler. They decide through the SetML document what they want to record. We would encourage you to just record everything because um, if you only record a subset, then you're, you're not going to be able to analyze other parts of the simulation, but that's up to the, the user. Yeah. And so we want to, we want basically, we want you to just store everything. And then we want to essentially make it our problem to figure out how to quickly get you the pieces that you want as you're trying to explore the results. And you know, this is definitely, I think, a different style than maybe what many people are used to, where you you use a desktop tool, it doesn't really store anything. So if you want to change your plot, like you have to rerun the whole uh, simulation again. This is, this is not really designed for that style. So oh, um, that does kind of bring to one limitation of the design is because the simulations get offloaded to a cluster, all of that is designed to be able to support long simulation runs, potentially using uh, many cores. Um, but it does introduce a little bit more lag. So it's hard for us to get the the kind of um, interactive speed that you might see in something like Escher FBA or in cell collective um, like the, the design has some inherent delay because we do go and run simulations on a cluster yeah uh, <clears throat> sorry kind of our group really i want to look at the current bio simulation that the whole design is many things really address what we want to do and for our group we do you know, the simulation is, itself is focused more on the GUI, the user interface. We do have the API, but current is, in general, our is just, <clears throat> we do not have enough resources, kind of manpower to, but um, when we have time, really have the resources, we will try to kind of uh, do tokenize and to kind of provide common line API to take advantage of the, the biosimulation, the framework. And as I mentioned, the one challenge is to kind of uh, distribute jobs to the multiple resources and then get data back. And I think a large number of simulations will face similar uh, challenge and then you guys already have those uh, framework we can try to take advantage, yeah. Yeah, I, I think we discussed this a little bit during Combine actually, um, but yeah. the, the way that the system is built, it's, it's all Docker containers uh, for each of the different parts and there's a Kubernetes manifest. Uh, so this can be deployed um, you know, to your own cluster uh, and the, the, as long as there's a HPC that supports Slurm, uh, you can change the URL of where the HPC is and run it on any sort of resource. Um, so if that's something that might be interesting, we can definitely uh, discuss more about that. 
Yeah, and <clears throat> we, <coughs> sorry, at the NH, we have a similar situation. So one is kind of probably from outside, we have to change certain kind of the workflow or design. And the current way for Simeon to run the part of the distributed mode for the run simulation is we have one centralized kind of database to control kind of um, the, the, the task, the simulation task, and the user put the simulation task to the centralized database. Individual kind of uh, computers can check to, to the, the centralized database rather than is more kind of to feasible to use uh, the current like biosimulation is how rather than check the centralized database, you can distribute the job to the individual um, uh, kind of the simulation machine or, or resources. Uh, I think there's some fundamental for, for our side, we need to kind of redesign or work on, even we already have certain kind of API um, we already, we have some Docker image for a long time ago, but really to take those part of computing strategy. So we, we still need to uh, do some work, yeah. One thing I, I would um, encourage uh, though is, um, so we've, we've created this registry and, and while we want to encourage developers to contribute standardized simulation tools with Docker images, um, we have created the registry such that um, simulation tools, it, it's not a requirement to submit a, a Docker image. You can simply submit like the name of your simulation tool, a URL, a brief description, and we would happily include that. And if you wanna include ideally a little bit more information like the format that it supports and the algorithms, so it's just some essentially metadata about the tool, um, we would love to, to see that, and then this would, could help advertise and help people find Simune as they're navigating different simulation tools. So that curation is something that can probably be done in you know, part of a day, or it, even just like, the very most basic curation can be done in, in a part of an hour. So that at least like, would get Simeon as part of the registered in, in the database, people can find it, even if there isn't a, a Docker container that we can use to execute Simeon simulations online with. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, I, I, we had a look at and then to see how much we can contribute, yeah. So it, basically it's designed, to, you know, as we were discussing before, like it's designed to have a low uh, overhead to entry. So mm -hmm. we want people to be able to register simulation tools easily. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, containerizing something, we, we understand this takes more work. So we don't want the containerization to prevent someone from registering a, a tool. And, and then what, what we enable is users can come and they can filter and you can see all of the tools or you can see just the ones that have validated Docker images. Yeah, for for long run, <coughs> sorry, for long run, I already see the BioNavGene is already kind of running up mm -hmm. in our system. So we we do have we we have some simple case we can communicate uh, with BioNavGene through the, the multi package mm -hmm. and um, yeah, we, we definitely we 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 also try to especially in the same time we. Recently, our group also we have some student work on some try to run certain models from bioenergy and in the same time compare with immune simulation. Um, yeah, there, there certain part is kind of is different. It's not different from the standard perspective. Is uh, some of them is really depend on the two in general because both Biology and and Simeon, they are rule-based modeling, but mm -hmm. when when you go to individual features, we still find something is different. And that's 
may be a little bit challenge if you want to share a certain model you can run on both play platforms and have the compared result but anyhow we, we can try to uh, yeah to do some work in this direction so, so we, um, you know, to that point, um, when we started this, I, I felt the same way as you. Like, as much as there have been efforts to, to standardize models, there's a lot of unique capabilities in different model formats and different simulation tools, and yeah. and all of this is is re really important to the modeler's ex experience. So, we have intentionally designed this in such a way that. We, we don't want to see Simeon only support SPML multi. We would like to see a Docker container for Simeon. I guess ideally would support Simeon's own format as well as the standard. And the standard, of course, it would allow some exchangeability with, with BionetGen, but it's subject to a little bit of limitation. So like in the case of the BioNetGen image, actually it does not currently support SPML multi, although it probably wouldn't take a lot of work to extend it. Right now that image actually directly supports BNGL. And so it, it supports all of the features of BioNetGen simulation. Yeah, for that part, I know previously from the James Feder group, uh, there one student there, they work on the um, Bionetgen the export function to the uh, multi. Actually, that worked pretty well. We try something. That's also the part of the reason we the, the multi package can be officially released because the we do set up certain uh, paths. We can uh, exchange certain mm -hmm. the model, and in the same time. As I mentioned, uh, different tool they may have a different feature. Mm -hmm. uh, that may also it may be a good thing because then we can uh, buy bridge through the standard, and then you can uh, kind of exchange the common shared feature and go to other tools to do to run modify certain simulation and then to run some features not available from in the other two. I, somehow that's a good uh, feature by the bridging through the standard. Don't have to be the same. Right, yes, it's very much, this is all very much intentionally designed such that, um, I mean, there needs to be some commonality, um, but at the same time, there has to be room for experimentation, yeah. flexibility, so this is all very much designed to to try to facilitate that need for flexibility. At the same time, we want enough standardization such that, uh, regardless what tool you use, you can get the data out in in a standard format, and then you can combine the output of any simulation tool with similar methods for analysis or visualization. Yeah. So that's the, the standardization here is really going on at a little bit higher level. At the model format level, we just say, you know, essentially use any model format, preferably one that a community uses, but we don't want to place any restriction on what format you, you use for exactly the, the reasons that you described. In fact, we don't really even uh, prescribe that you have to use ZML or combine, um, but there aren't really great alternatives to those. So um, effectively we, like from a software design perspective, we have not really uh, anywhere assumed that the simulation experiments are described in ZML. But all the containers uh, only support ZML. I, I'm I'm curious. So, for the current progress, the biosimulation, what's most kind of difficult or challenging things you guys ha have faced from perspective, for example, the uh, 
the performance of some uh, integration uh, was in the most challenging things. I would say that's probably Jonathan your work with getting SetML consistent yeah. across all the containers. <laughs> yeah, SetML is definitely one of the thornier issues for sure. Um, I, it's not an, an I wouldn't say it's an intellectually complicated issue. It's it's fairly intellectually simple, but from a practical standpoint, the diversity of of simulation tools like despite the fact that SPML exists and SetML exists, like in practice they're used in substantially inconsistent ways. And so ironing out all that inconsistency does take a, a bit of work. Okay, thanks. But, um, and I think one of the other more intellectually challenging things that we're working on is, is what Bilal is working on to, to try to make it possible, not just a stored large data sets, but to be able to efficiently extract out pieces of them and do uh, basic computations on them. I mean, for this, we're, I think, we're largely just trying to take advantage of tools that already exist in the HDF5 sphere. Um, but we have yet to fully probe exactly the limits of that. So, yeah, so the, the HDF5 group does have a uh cloud framework that's designed to essentially uh, break HDF5 files up into you know, chunks that can be stored as objects on S3 or Google Cloud Bucket, for example. Um, so I've been working to integrate that into the rest of our, our framework. So that's the, the challenges there for now are mostly just uh, programming and technical how to fit it in. Um, but once we fit that in, then we can you know, really begin to see how this fits into your use case, for example, where you have uh, simulations running for weeks producing data um, is this going to be a viable way to, you know, really filter and query that data? Here's the sex. All right, should we wait two more minutes and then get started again?
Okay. Okay, so we're now, right now on to our, our second session. So our first session was on a um, brief tutorial for users on how to run simulations using, how to create uh, simulations using a variety of different tools. We showed one example using JWS online and then how to execute the simulations using run bio simulations. Ball also showed how to download the Docker images that we use to execute simulations with run bio simulations to use those locally on your own machine. We also showed how it's possible to download the Python packages, which are inside of each of these Docker, Docker images as another way to execute simulations. And, and a fourth method is, as Bilal showed, there's a REST API, which can also be used to, to run simulations. And all of this is access to the same a uh, broad set of algorithms that um, that you can see at, at biosimulators.org. So then um, Bilal also showed biosimulators.org, uh, showing how you can browse the available simulation tools, see the algorithms, the model formats that they support, see the validation that each of these tools has passed. So our next session, we're going to discuss how to create a simulation tool and then um, Tuesday to Thursday, we have reserved time to work together with the community. And finally, we have a, a forum scheduled for Friday. Are there any questions? Okay, so just as a, a reminder um, for, for Working together as a community uh, as part of a hackathon, and we created um, discussions on on GitHub and um, and a channel in Slack. Okay, so what we wanted to do in this hour is dig a little bit deeper into exactly how biosimulators and, and run biosimulations work um, to explain the the formats that we rely on and how all of this can be extended to contribute additional simulation tools with additional algorithms, additional model formats, additional modeling formalisms. So essentially the, the outline of, uh, okay, so essentially the, the um, way that biosimulators works is that we have a set of standardized Docker images which have the same, um, uh, which have consistent entry points that um, support a standard set of inputs and outputs. The, the standard input to all of these Dockerized simulation tools is a combine archive, which should contain typically a description of a, a simulation, generally in, in SETML format, and a, typically a description of a model in ideally in a community supported model format such as SPML. But very importantly, um, the models can be in, in any format. We have already examples of models using other SPML packages, including SPML flux balance, SPML uh, qualitative models. Uh, we're working, Chris Meyer's group is, is working on contributing iBiosim, which will have examples with SPML comp. Uh, we have a BioNetGen container already, which works with the BioNetGen model language format, BNGL. Um, the, the architecture also does not really assume that we use SetML to describe simulation tasks, but all of the simulation tools that we've created so far do use uh, SetML. So it's possible to build other tools which with use other formats, Certainly other model formats, we already have examples and even other simulation formats. Then all of the, the tools produce results in, as HDF5 files. These are binary files, which allow us to essentially contain multiple multi-dimensional tables within a single file. And they're structured such that 
uh, once you write the files, you can easily query out pieces of, of the data that's encoded into them, and it's not necessary to read the entire file to do that. So by structuring uh, simulation tasks this way, we can then uh, decouple simulation from subsequent analysis and visualization of uh, simulation or other analyses on models such that analysis and, and visualization can be directly connected to the results of simulations um, rather than trying to uh, connect analysis and visualization directly to the execution of simulation. So um, the way that to, to dig into the, the Docker can, uh, images a little bit further. So the Docker images inside of them, they each have a standardized entry point. And the entry points are essentially like command line programs. So we've basically taken these Docker images and used them to wrap a command line uh, program. That command line program has two inputs, a path to a combined archive that should be executed and a path to a directory in which the results should be stored. And the results are, are intended to be, in, uh, despite what it says here, they're intended to be in, stored in HDF format. If simulation tools produce other outputs such as charts, um, that will, can be put into these directories of, of results as well. And the other thing principally that, that gets included in directories are logs of the execution of a combine archive. Now, in the case of all of the simulation tools that we have built so far, these standardized command line interfaces, which are inside of the Docker image, they are then in turn attached to an underlying, um, actually in most cases, they're attached to a, a Python library, which is then in turn attached to an underlying simulation tool. So there's several layers which we add together, which ultimately provide us with a standardized Docker image, which supports input in uh, as combined archives and outputs as directories of results um, with the, the key results being encompassed by HDF5 files. Okay, so just drilling down a little bit further, again, we have at the center this standardized simulation tools, the input being combined archives, the outputs being uh, HDF with simulation results, plots, um, typically in PDF format. And, and then we have logs of the execution of combine archives, which we have developed a, a JSON schema for. So that uh, composes a standardized Docker image. So typically the, the simulation projects have inside of the, the combine archives have inside of them SETML files, and then SETML files typically would reference models in a format such as SVML, and they also uh, reference algorithms and parameters of those algorithms. And, and that's done uh, through the use of CASAL terms to identify specific algorithms and parameters. So the way that we uh, encourage consistency in the execution of simulations is that we uh, encourage developers to contribute terms to CASAL. And then if you're uh, trying to understand how to make a simulation tool consistent with other tools, you would look into CASAL to see if there's already a term for the algorithm that you've implemented. If so, you would map that term onto a method in, in your simulation tool. If not, then you would request a new term for another simulation algorithm or new terms for new parameters of, of that algorithm. Uh, and then for visualizations, we are also beginning to encourage uh, the community to use Vega as a, a format for uh, a broad range of visualizations. One other format that we have in the mix is we, or schema that we have in the mix, is we have developed a schema that captures the capabilities of simulation tools. So this captures things like uh, URL where there's documentation for the tool, captures authors, references, and then critically it captures 
the algorithms that the tool supports, the parameters of those algorithms, um, the data types of those parameters, the default values of those parameters. Uh, if there's a recommended range of values that can be captured. We can also capture things like the um, user interfaces that are that um, each algorithm is available through. So we can capture, for example, that a, a simulation tool provides a desktop interface or a web-based interface or a library. We can capture the programming languages that uh, simulation tools provide bindings for. We can capture the operating systems that simulation tools support. So all that metadata is then made available through biosimulators.org to help the community find specific simulation tools that fit their needs for particular modeling projects. And all these capabilities are, are annotating using three additional ontologies. We use the systems biology ontology to annotate modeling formats that simulation tools support. We use the EDAM ontology to, to indicate formats that tools support. And we use the semantic information ontology to indicate the independent variables that are involved in the algorithms that simulation tools support. And so as necessary, um, we need to add additional terms to these ontologies to uh, bring additional simulation tools into biosimulators that involve other modeling formats or, or formats or independent variables. Um, in practice, we've already gone ahead and requested a lot of terms that, that this community would likely need. Um, so the main, the main place where we will still be adding new terms to incorporate new tools is to CASAO. So to drill into SETML um, a little bit further, Essentially, the SETML is a, uh, a language, a format for describing simulation experiments. The inputs to those experiments are typically models, potentially one or more changes to models. So this could be changes to attributes, could be the addition of elements to a model, the removal of elements, or the replacement of uh, elements. Uh, then SETML files describe algorithms and their parameters. So models are typically described using a format like SPML, and algorithms and their parameters are typically, or well, need to be described by referencing terms in the Cazal ontology. So then SETML supports two types of uh, simulation tasks. There are what I've, I've called here, uh, in, in SETML it's just called task, but these are essentially like atomic simulation tasks. These can be used to execute time courses, can be used to execute a steady state simulation, and going forward to better support um, uh, other analyses of models beyond um, time course and steady state simulations, we will need to push SETML to record, recognize a more general type of simulation task, uh, which could be applied in, in a broader range of circumstances. So then ZML supports uh, what's called a, a repeated task. Uh, roughly, you can think of this as like a for loop, where for each iteration of the for loop, you can set an attribute of a model to a specific value. So this can be used to encode things like parameter scans. You can iterate over a range of values of a particular parameter or a matrix of, a range of, uh, of ranges of, of multiple parameters. And then for each iteration, set a value of a parameter in a model to execute a something like a parameter scan. So the third part of SETML is the description of outputs of, of simulation experiments. SETML supports two kinds of outputs. There were reports, which are uh, SETML uses the, the term data sets. So a report is a collection of data sets. A data set is essentially is typically equal to the predicted value of a variable of a model, uh, often over a, a predicted time course. So these uh, predictions for model variables can be collected into reports. 
SendML files can have multiple reports. And in addition, SendML supports uh, a, a few types of basic statistical charts. So biosimulators and, and run biosimulations primarily builds on uh, data sets. So we essentially encourage users to use data or use reports to capture all of the models of all of the outputs of a model. And then all of the outputs can subsequently be explored interactively after they're saved into a database of simulation results. So as I mentioned, SetML uses the Casal ontology to indicate specific algorithms and their parameters which should be executed. Now, I think it's important to point out at this point that despite its name, so the name of Casal is the kinetic simulation algorithm ontology. Despite its name, Casal has many algorithms that are uh, part of the ontology, which are not algorithms for executing kinetic simulations. Casal already has terms for a variety of methods for logical simulation, for flux balance simulation, for optimization. So at this point, I would think of Casal as, as a little bit of, or the name of Casal is a little bit of a misnomer. It's, it's really more like at this point, an ontology of mathematical algorithms and the parameters of those algorithms. And it can be, uh, we can continue to expand it as a community to branch out from, from just forward simulation methods to other kinds of analyses on models like parameter estimation or analyses of the structure of models. So that's, as, as we see it, that's what provides the path forward to expand the, the capabilities of biosimulators or to extend beyond the capabilities of the current Docker images that are part of, of the biosimulators registry to other tasks uh, beyond forward simulation. So we have already expanded Casal by about a third in order to uh, get all the, the forward simulation algorithms that we have uh, curated working. And in order to keep going, we will need to continue to, to expand Casal. But this is fairly easy um, to do. We can, like for example, tomorrow, if we want to add new terms, I can work with people to, to add new terms and get them in, incorporated into Casal and approved and posted uh, by tomorrow. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is just a little bit more detail about what I, I said before about the outputs of, of SetML. So again, it, SetML can describe one or more reports. Each of these reports can have one or more data sets and the data sets capture in, what in, in SetML are called data generators, which are, typic, which are mathematical expressions of one or more simulation outputs. And those can be either dependent model variables or our independent variables such as time. But generally the way that we're encouraging this to be used is that data generators or data sets should be mapped to generator data generators which contain the, the outputs of just a single variable. And then this allows modelers to subsequently do additional uh, mathematical op operations on simulation results after the fact um, in a more exploratory, in a more uh, interactive exploratory manner. Okay, so drilling down a little bit further on HDF5. So HDF5 is a binary format for collections of multidimensional data sets. So the multidimensional data sets you can think of as, as just multidimensional matrices. If you're familiar with Python, these are essentially equivalent to NumPy and dimensional matrices. So the collection of, of data sets within a HDF5 file is organized hierarchically similar to a file system. And so the way that we're using this is when we output simulation results to an HDF5 file, the organization of that HDF5 file will parallel the organization of the combine archive from which the uh, which was executed to generate the results that get encoded into the file. So um, what that means is if a simulation experiment is 
embedded inside of a nested chain of directories in a setml file, then when its results get back to HDF5, it will be the corresponding results for reports will, will be correspondingly organized in the same hierarchy within the HDF5 file. In addition to um, multidimensional data, HDF can also capture key value pairs of attributes of metadata. So we are using this, for example, to capture labels or identifiers for the data sets. We can capture data types. We can capture the original size so that even as we cast data into a multidimensional matrix, we can uh, read out the data in potentially the original data structure that the simulation tool used. Another key feature of HDF is that these matrices can be stored in chunks. So if you have a very large matrix, which maybe contains the results of many individual simulations, HDF, you can use HDF to store all of that results in chunks. And what this means is that when you want to retrieve results out later, you don't have to read the entire file. You can read only the chunks in which pieces of the data that you want are stored. So this facilitates much faster retrieval than if you stored all of the results as a single block that has to be read to extract out even the smallest slice of the result set. So there are other choices, but we focus on HDF for, for several reasons. And one of the big ones is that there are libraries for HDF for most major languages, including Python, C, Java, Perl, R, MATLAB, um, and some of the other libraries that you, or other formats that we might consider as alternatives uh, do have a few advantages, but one of the big disadvantages is that they generally only have libraries for a single language. So here's exactly how we map the results of simulation experiments to, to set of L. So we will produce a single combine or a single HDF5 file per combine archive. That setML file or that combine archive contain, can contain one or more setML files. So each of these setML files will get mapped to a group within an HDF5 file. The setML files can contain multiple reports. So each re report will get mapped to an HDF5 data set. Um, and then the setML reports can contain one or more setML data sets which get essentially get mapped to distinct rows of an HDF5 data set. So I realized that there's some overlapping terminology here. SetML and, and HDF, unfortunately, use some of the same terms to mean slightly different things. So in particular, the term report or the term data set is used both in, in SetML and in HDF, and they're used in different ways. Then the metadata about uh, a, a the, about the results of a simulation experiment that gets encoded into the attributes of an HDF5 data set. And presently, we keep track of data metadata such as the IDs of the SetML data sets, the, the labels of of SetML data sets, the data original data types of each data set, the original shape of each data set, and and so on. So the, the next um, format that the, the simulation tools uh, produce re results in is a, a schema that we've developed to capture the, a log, a structured log of the execution of each combine archive. So what motivated this is that uh, we recognize that if we're going to have simulation experiment like SetML files, which describe many individual simulation tasks, um, it could become quite challenging to debug large simulation experiments that involve many tasks. So we wanted to be able to, to structure the log to facilitate debugging. And so what we do is essentially we capture logs in a more granular way to make it easy to find problems with specific tasks in what could potentially be a large simulation experiment. So for 
for each task, we can re we can record its status, um, and this can be used to to um, uh, going forward. We could potentially use this to keep more granular um, uh, information about the, the current execution status of each individual task in a simulation experiment. That, so the, the task can be queued, running, succeeded, failed, or skipped. The, the logs can capture the, the algorithm that a simulation tool actually executed. So the reason that this can be important is that, of course, no simulation tool executes every possible algorithm. So often simulation tools will they'll see a, a, a specific CASAL term, recognize that they don't have the capability to execute that particular algorithm and execute a different, maybe similar algorithm instead. So the logs can be used to capture not just what was requested in a simulation experiment, but what the simulation tool actually did. And, and to drill down even more further to provide even more transparency, the logs can capture the specific function that the simulation tool executed and the arguments that were used to facilitate debugging or to facilitate reuse of the same simulation experiment using the underlying tool, which is encapsulated into the Docker image. Where there are failures or where uh, tasks are skipped, uh, the reasons for those failures or, or skips can be captured. We can capture the duration. And of course, we also capture the standard output and standard error that was produced from the execution of each task. So this same uh, log structure is used to capture both the, the execution of simulation tasks, as well as the execution of reports and, and plots in ZML files. So Bilal showed this in, uh, or gave an example of this in the, the previous session, but this is what the, the command line interfaces for simulation tools are intended to look like. So each, the main, the key things are that each simulation tool is intended to have an input argument to a path to a combine archive file and, and a second argument which provides a path to a directory in which simulation results should be saved. And we have also supported a couple of other standardized arguments for help. We have two, two ways of printing out help information, and we also have a standardized option for, for, for printing out version information about, the, about a simulation tool. So we'll all show this before, but just to reiterate, reiterate um, this is what the standard command line uh, interface enables. It makes it easy for us to execute the same simulation experiment, same common archive using multiple tools. Of course, up to the, the limitation that each tool supports different algorithms or set of algorithms. But in cases where uh, two tools or multiple tools all support the same algorithm, then simply by changing the, the name of the simulation program, we can execute that study using one of, of multiple tools. So this can be handy if you want to compare simulation tools together, or if maybe you're experiencing a, a bug with one simulation tool and you want to try a simulation with another tool, you can quickly switch to another tool and um, and see if that, that tool is able to get around the, the error that you experienced with the first tool. OK, so then these command line interfaces get packaged up into Docker images. So Docker images, for anyone that's not familiar, these are essentially like virtual operating systems. And the key thing is that they can extract potentially complex computational environments. So they make it easy to package up not only a simulation tool, but all of the dependencies which are required to, um, to execute that simulation tool. And so if that, that computational environment is potentially somewhat complex to recreate on someone else's machine, 
this can be easily packaged into a Docker image. The Docker image can then be hosted to a repository and other people in the community can easily pull that Docker image from a repository. Um, another key thing about Docker images is that the instructions to create them are transparent and to a great extent, though, though not perfect, uh, Docker images, construction of Docker images are reproducible. So this means that if someone in the community downloads a, a Docker image, they can inspect that Docker image to see exactly how that image was created. Docker images also support, also support labels. So this is very similar to, um, to tags in, in Git. This makes it easy to uh, manage versions of simulation tools by tagging each of the Docker images for each version of a simulation tool with labels for, for different versions. Okay, so the, the next format to, to be aware of is that we've developed a schema for capturing the capabilities of a simulation tool. So this um, can capture the, the model formats that a simulation tool supports, the modeling frameworks. So that would be like logical modeling, flux balance analysis, um, continuous simulation, discrete simulation, spatial, spatial discrete, spatial continuous. This uh, a schema can capture the algorithms that a simulation tool supports and the parameters of those algorithms, as well as the data types of those parameters, the default value of those parameters, the rec and if there's a recommended range of values, all of this can be captured. So essentially what this, this, um, this uh, schema for the specification of a simulation tool is intended to, to capture is, first of all, information that the community might need to determine whether uh, a simulation tool would be useful for the project that, for the modeling project that they have. So whether it supports the model and format that they want to work with and the algorithms that they want to work with. And second, the, the file tries to capture, or the, the schema tries to capture all the information which would be necessary to know how to use the algorithms that the simulation tool supports. And so that's why this file captures the data types of the parameters, the default values, recommended range, and um, as I'll, I'll note next, we also capture information that's needed to know how to use a simulation tool in conjunction with ZML. Um, this format can also capture metadata about simulation tools. It can capture things like the author, the programming languages that it supports, the interfaces like desktop, command line interface, library, web-based, operating systems, who funded it, references, and, and so on. Yeah, so that's, that's the metadata that I mentioned. And then finally, um, this format, the, this, the schema also captures a record of how the simulation tool was, was verified. That is structured like um, similar to a set of unit test results and we, uh, and we'll, sh we'll show the, the, the test suite, but um, for each test that the test suite executes, we'll capture the, an identifier and a description of the tests, the model formats and algorithms that were involved, and whether the simulation tool passed or, or failed the, um, the test. And if it failed, then we would capture a reason why the test failed. Okay, so any questions about the formats at this point before we, we dig in a little bit deeper to exactly how to create a simulation tool and then submit that to biosimulators? All right, I'll take that as a... 
Is there a question? Oh yeah, uh, quick question. Um, do you have like a, a JSON schemas for these JSON uh, files? Yes, there's oh. two. So the, there, it's available primarily in open API format, but we have also converted it to JSON schema. Okay, perfect, thanks. So the, um, well, as, as Paul showed before, you can see the, the documentation for the schema at the um, at the biosimulators API, and then um, there's a link there, as well as from the, the biosimulators.org webpage. There's a link to the, both the Open API and the JSON schema versions of the, the schemas. And maybe one more question from my side. So I was not aware of this visualization um, specification language Vega so far. Are there any uh, tools, for instance, for Python, which can be directly used with that? Yes, um, there, there's a whole ecosystem of things around Vega. Um, on, from Python, there's a, a package called Altair, which can be used to author Vega documents uh, from Python. So I think you can roughly think of this as a an alternative to using matplotlib. And um, that can produce basic charts, uh, similar to what you, you can generate with matplotlib. And that can also be, I believe that that can also be used to author arbitrary graphics. So things beyond what you can do with, with matplotlib. <clears throat> and um, maybe one more question here. Um, I think you mentioned on one slide that you, I mean, obviously ZML also supports the definition of basic uh, yeah. basic files. Do you also plan to allow for the construction of more complicated files, for instance, using a Vega type thing then? Or yeah. will it only so, be? So the, at the moment, the simulation tools are working with ZML um, L1v3, and L1v3 only supports two plots. Uh, it supports a two-dimensional line series plot and a three-dimensional uh, plot. The, the next version of, of ZML does support a few additional types of, of plots, but fundamentally it's a limited uh, set of plots. And so that's where Vega comes in. Vega is quite a bit more flexible. Um, you can use Vega to capture things like, um, like a flux map or a metabolic network where you paint, well, I'll show this in the previous hour, at, uh, and I can show this again, uh, where you can paint the, um, the edges in a, in a network um, based on predicted fluxes. In Vega, you can also do things like describe interactivity. So if you want to describe tooltips or zooming or panning, uh, that can be done. You can describe things like linked charts. So if you want to have one chart which is interactive and then have another chart respond to that, that's also possible to describe using Vega. Okay, cool. Um, and beyond that, there's there are a few other things in the Vega ecosystem. There's also an interactive Vega editor. There's an interactive visual Vega editor. There's a, a yet higher level language for Vega called Vega Lite. Um, so there's a bunch of things in, in the Vega ecosystem that one can take advantage of. But really the key thing why, why we're embracing it is that we recognize that um, if you look at publications, uh, publications often involve complex plots. And um, if our goal is to be able to be able to generate and, and reproduce uh, complex figures, then, then we need to embrace something which is going to be able to capture uh, essentially any arbitrary visualization. So that's what led us to Vega. The one major limitation is that Vega is really primarily oriented to two-dimensional visualizations. The, the Vega ecosystem really doesn't have um, any built-in support for three-dimensional visualization.
Okay, so the first thing that we, if we want to develop a simulation tool, the, the first thing that we would need to do is build in standard processing for combine archives and, and setML. So the simulation tool would need to unpack the combine archive, identify the simulation experiment files inside that, that archive, and then execute those, uh, those simulation experiment files, collect their outputs, log the, the execution, and save all the results to an HDFI file. And um, if simulation tools um, decide to, they can also support plots or other uh, outputs, which can also be bundled into um, or saved to the, to the same output directory, in which case run by simulations will save all the outputs and make that available to users. So to, to do this, um, as part of executing a setML file, tools will have to resolve the models which are indicated, apply model changes, uh, map CASAL terms to specific functions for executing algorithms, um, execute those, those functions, collect their outputs, uh, log their status. So at present, all of the examples that most of the examples that we've created represent forward simulation algorithms. But by adding additional terms to CASAL, we can expand this to, to um, other algorithms beyond forward simulation. So this is how we could expand to a parameter estimation methods, other static analyses of, of models which don't produce time courses. All of this, I think, can be encoded into this uh, framework. And especially if we push to make ZML a little bit more general, I think all of this could be encoded fairly nicely into ZML files and in, inside common archives. Now, one thing that we you know, uh, recognize quite acutely from, from this project is that although there are some tools which already support ZML, um, there's a fair degree of inconsistency in the execution of ZML documents uh, among the the few tools which uh, do already support ZML. So in order to encourage consistency, we have put together some uh, guidelines which essentially fill in some gaps and some things that are not clear in the ZML uh, documentation to encourage simulation tools to be more consistent in exactly how they support ZML. So I don't, we can skip over this. Um, but it's just to say that we, we do recognize that there's a lot of inconsistency and we have tried to navigate that but by providing a specific set of guidelines for how to use ZML. And in most cases, this doesn't correspond to how any individual simulation tool, uh, any existing simulation tool actually implements ZML. Um, right, so as, as we discussed, I think all of this can be extended beyond um, forward simulation algorithms to a substantial degree it, it is already um, being applied beyond kinetic simulation algorithms we already have examples with flex balance analysis methods we already have examples with logical simulation methods uh, we have an example of a, a steady state analysis um, method um, so i think we have shown that we can continue to expand this beyond forward simulation methods um, largely by introducing new CASAL terms, mapping out, and then mapping those new CASAL terms to functions of simulation tools. So the next thing that we would need to do is, um, so essentially we would, you would build a uh, library of methods for processing combine archives and SETML documents inside of combine archives. Then you would map that um, those methods for executing combine archives to command line interface, which supports the arguments that, that I discussed previously. So the next thing we would do is we then take that command line program and attach it to the endpoint, entry point to a Docker image. So the Docker image would first start from a particular operating system, then in install any dependencies which are necessary for the command line program and then finally map the entry point of that command line program to the command line interface.
so to help um, people understand how to use uh, a Docker image, we also encourage the Docker images to define all of the environment variables that the tool supports and the default values that the, the tool uses. And we also encourage tools to use open container labels and bio, uh, bio containers labels to capture metadata about tools. So this way you can take your Docker image and uh, post it to registries like Docker Hub or GitHub Container Registry, and they will automatically re recognize all the metadata that you embed into, into your Docker image. So once you've created the Docker image, then we, we want the Docker image to be published to a public repository. And you can use any public repository. Um, for our purposes, it, it doesn't um, matter. Uh, we in, in, internally use the GitHub Container Registry. We like it a lot because you can manage it using the same uh, GitHub accounts that many of us are using to capture software repositories. Um, Docker Hub, of course, is also a very popular place to post images. Another benefit of the GitHub Container Registry is that it doesn't, at least presently, have the limitations on, on polls that the Docker Hub Registry has recently imposed. So, okay, once we have built a Docker image and we uh, pushed it to a public repository, then the next thing that we need to do is curate the capabilities of the tool. So as we, as I discussed before, we would curate the formats of the supports, the modeling framework, the algorithms, and, and metadata about the simulation tool. And all this would get encoded into a uh, JSON schema. We have, um, so the schema is, is available online. And we also have a tool that's available through the Biosimulators API for validating that a specification is consistent with the schema. And if there are any errors, then the validation tool will, will tell you all the inconsistencies that there are between the specification of your tool and the schema. Now, as part of curating um, a, a simulation tool, in many cases, it may be necessary to request additional ontology terms. So I've included here information about how you can request new terms for all of the ontologies that we're working with. Um, the main one that we need to, the main one which we have to likely continue to add new terms to, as, as I've mentioned, is Casal. Luckily, I have become the primary maintainer of Casal, and so I can easily help people add new terms. Um, the other ontologies that we're working with, again, are, are EDIM for formats. Uh, I think in many cases, it won't be necessary to request additional terms because I've gone ahead and requested terms that this community um, needs. And that even includes things like PE tab. Um, similarly, I think the systems biology ontology already includes most, if not all, of the terms that this community needs. So in practice, I don't think there's much need to contribute many new terms to, to at the SBO. Um, and then the final ontology is um, the semantic information ontology. This is, uh, again, we've gone ahead and, and tried to request all the terms that we think that this community would need. So there shouldn't be a lot of need to request new SIO terms. And, and in, in any case, this whole uh, ecosystem is not very dependent on SIO terms. So um, if we don't have a, a term available yet, that's, that's not going to be a problem that can always be added to the annotation later as it get, gets approved. Uh, we also use one other, it's not an ontology, but it's um, structured in many ways, similar ontology. We use a, a, a dictionary of licenses called SPDX. Uh, that's available at spdx.org. And um, so this allows us, this provides us essentially a standardized vocabulary for describing licenses to simulation tools. So in most cases, unless you're using a custom license, it shouldn't be necessary to request new terms because SPDX already 
has terms for all the major open source software licenses. Okay, so once you've created a simulation tool, you've pushed it to a uh, public Docker registry, you've annotated it, then we can go ahead and, um, and validate the simulation tool with the test suite that we've created. For, so for this, we have two options. To make it easy to validate simulation tools and to help us curate simulation tools, we've created a cloud deployment. This uses GitHub issues and actions, and, and I'll show you exactly how we, we can utilize that. There is a second option, which is you can install and run the test suite locally. This provides a little bit more flexibility. So similar to a unit test runner like PyTest, uh, this can be used to run not just the whole test suite and all the tests, but you can run individual tests. So, um, well, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll show you how this works and then I can dig into exactly what the, the tests are, are testing. So to create, um, to execute the, the, the cloud runner that we provide, you can access this at GitHub issues. Um, so what you would do is you'd come to the biosimulators GitHub repository, you click on issues, and then you can uh, click here on this issue template to validate or contribute a simulator. This essentially provides you with um, a, um, uh, some instructions on how to create simulation tools. And then to, to actually submit a simulation tool, what you do is provide a, a bit of data in YAML format into the body of the, the first message of the issue. So as you can see, um, what, what you're asked to provide is an ID for the, the simulation tool, the version that you'd like to validate, and then a URL where the specifications can be obtained. And then this specification in, inside of it will tell us where the Docker image is. So then the, the validator will go and pull that Docker image and run the test suite on the Docker image. And we have a few options here. So if you want to, this can be used either to submit a simulation tool to the registry, or it can be used just to validate a tool if you're, you want to validate a tool um, as you're developing it, but you're not ready to commit it. Um, you can control that by setting these, these two keys here, validate image and, and commit simulator to true or false. So the, the, so when you uh, create this image, what will happen is this will trigger a GitHub action, which will go and use the test suite uh, to uh, pull your specifications, in turn pull your Docker image, and then use the test suite to validate your image. The results of the, the, the execution of the test suite will get posted as messages to this, this GitHub issue. And so the user who has created this issue or other users who subscribe to it will get email notification. If you set up email notifications, you'll get email notifications of the results of the, the validation of your simulation tool that you've submitted. So this will include a summary. And then below the summary, we'll have more detailed information about the, um, the status of individual tests, which either had warnings or were skipped or were failed. If the validation is successful, then you would receive a message saying that your simulator is valid and thanking you for your submission to the registry. Now, the first time that you submit a simulation tool to the registry, um, the, the, simulation, the, the simulation tool will get um, assigned to myself to curate that, that tool. Uh, and then once uh, I review it and approve it, it'll get uh, submitted to the database. Now, subsequent submissions of the same simulation tool will get approved automatically so that new versions of simulation tools can be uh, posted in, in an automated way. So this is an example of what a failure would look like. Now, inside the, when we post information about the, um, about the job, which is going to, to validate your simulation tool, we provide a link to the GitHub action, which 
um, is used to validate your simulation tool. So this provides some transparency over exactly how we're validating and curating simulation tools. And not only you as the submitter, but the entire community can see all the information about how we're, how, how we're uh, validating and curating simulation tools. So you can drill down in, uh, on this to see exactly how we validate a simulation tool and what it, it's, um, uh, uh, what its um, validation job looks like. So this uh, this GitHub issue action system is is basically set up uh, one to provide a cloud deployment that the community can use to validate simulation tools without having to install the the test suite on their own machines. And second, it's set up to provide a very high degree of transparency so that anybody who wants to use these tools can see all the details of how a simulation tool was was validated and, and curated. And if, if there are any failures, this system also allows us as the, um, as the lead developers of, of biosimulators to be able to see those errors and give people advice or help to resolve errors that they may be experiencing in the validation of their um, simulation tools. So the, the test suite tests for several things. Um, essentially, we're going to we're going to test for standard behavior uh, along all the dimensions of simulation tools. So we test that the standard that the command line interface supports the standard arguments. We test that the Docker image supports the standard entry point that we've outlined and the standard labels that we recommend. We test that combine archives are executed as intended. Uh, and then the main part of the test suite is we test that set ML documents are executed as intended. So we test that um, that models or si that simulations are executed and that reports are constructed with the expected uh, output structures and values. Now, uh, this is a point where we have the opportunity, if we wanted to, to integrate even deeper testing. So if we wanted to integrate into this test suites for specific model languages, that could be done. Or um, if there's a desire to use uh, other formats than setML, um, this is a point at which we could execute other uh, test suites in, in in place of this, um, these SetML tests. So what would happen is, is basically, if we, as we expand this, then um, many of this, the, the tests will get skipped for particular simulation tools, which don't support the relevant formats or relevant algorithms. And the, um, the test would get, would get expanded with a larger number of cases that cover different formats. So the, the SetML test suites are this, the SetML tests are composed of two parts. First, there's a set of curated combine archives that um, where we have not only curated simulation experiments, but we also have curated expected results. And so we go and run these um, curated archives, which are essentially all derived from published simulation, published papers. And we check that their outputs are generated as expected. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, the problem with this design is that there's a lot of features of SetML and there's a lot of model languages that we would like to use this in conjunction with. And we don't want to have to curate a large number of, of archives for every model format, every simulation algorithm, um, and every feature of, of SetML. So instead, what we do is, uh, so the there's a, a readme in the the GitHub repository for the, the test suite, which outlines all these curated archives. So the, the other thing that we do, and the, the primary way that we generate examples for the test suite is we use these curated archives to synthetically generate additional archives, which allow us to probe for support for particular features of SetML or particular simulation algorithms. 
So this allows us to, if, if we want to expand the test suite to another model format, then in many cases, we will only need to add a single additional curated archive. So for example, the all of the tests for the flux balance analysis package for SPML or all the tests for the uh, qualitative modeling package for SPML, all of those are conducted just with one combined archive each for flex balance and one combined uh, one combine archive for uh, for qualitative modeling. So it's quite easy to expand the the test suite to additional model formats because the test suite will just go and synthetically create all the test cases that are necessary from just one archive. So what that means is that the, the test suite is going to generate uh, synthetic combine archives during its execution. And the command line version of the test suite provides an option to save these archives out. So if you're building a simulation tool, you're running the test suite and you're, uh, the test suite is failing on your simulation tool, you can um, use the command line version of this to output the synthetically generated archives so that you can inspect them or run them directly with your tool. Okay, so once you've got your simulation tool working consistently, then you'd be ready to simulate to submit that to the biosimulators registry. So you can use the same GitHub issue that I showed before, uh, but this time you would indicate that you want to submit your simulation tool to the registry. This will then go ahead and use a GitHub action to execute the test suite. And then as I mentioned, the first time that the test suite is submitted, then we would, um, assign the, the GitHub issue to a curator, which would be myself, to review the, the simulation tool. Um, and then subsequent version, or submission of subsequent versions of the simulation tool will be automatically accepted um, if they pass the test suite. Now, we would like uh, simulation tools to, to automatically, or we would like simulation tools to release uh, not just a single version to biosimilars, but we've structured this to try and make it easy for developers to continuously submit new versions of their tools, just as you would push them to um, PyPy or CRAN or, or other um, software management packages. So because this builds on GitHub issues and, and GitHub actions, this can be done by using the GitHub API to programmatically create issues to submit simulation tools to um, the biosimulators uh, GitHub repository. And then again, once those issues are created, the, um, the tool will be uh, automatically validated. And if there's already a version of that tool which has been um, approved in the database, then the, the, the new version of the tool will automatically get accepted into the registry. And, and furthermore, we would en encourage developers to integrate calls to the GitHub API into continuous development or continuous deployment actions in their the repositories that they use or associated with the repositories that they use to manage their simulation tools. So we have examples for how to do this with GitHub Actions, where you can um, attach an, an action to use the GitHub API to push your simulation tool to biosimulators to the creation of a new tag or new release to your GitHub repository. <clears throat> so um, we have created a couple of resources to, to help you develop standardized uh, simulation tools. So as Matthias asked, we, we do have schemas for the couple of JSON formats that we've created, both for the, the format for logs of of the execution of simulations and for the results of tests of uh, or validation tests of simulation tools. Um, we also have um, a library that's called Biosimulators Utils, which can be combined, especially with Python based simulation tools, to provide combine and setML support uh, quite quickly with in most cases, probably only a few hundred lines of code to create a standardized uh, simulation tool. 
We also have a, an online validation program for validating that the uh, capabilities of simulation tools are consistent with the JSON schema that we've defined. And, and then finally, we also have guidance on how to use uh, SETML and, and HDF and all the other formats that we, that we um, have embraced online at, at biosimulators.org. Okay, so before I, I stop and, and open up this up for questions and discussion, I just wanted to remind everyone about the outline for the rest of Harmony. So today we, we gave two brief tutorials on how to use run bio simulations and how to develop additional simulation tools. What we have scheduled for tomorrow is we reserve time for the biosimulators, run bio simulations developers to help the community develop anything that you would like to develop on top of the platform or contribute to the platform. And then on Friday, we have scheduled an open forum for feedback or, and discussion about future directions. So in the slides, which are available on Sketch, we have some ideas about potential hackathon projects for tomorrow. And we have links for places to facilitate discussion during the hackathon. All right, so I'll stop there. And okay, it looks like Mort says a question. Can I provide the links for GitHub uh, actions? Yes, you can put that here. So I can uh, show you exactly what this looks like. So in, in most cases, we have um, to kind of get this going. We've been externally adding um, In most cases, we have been externally adding support for Combine and, and SetML to simulation tools. And this external support is is right now st structured into a separate set of repositories from the underlying simulation tools. So this is an example of a repository that we've created, which adds Combine and, and SetML to CobraPy. Now, going forward, we would ideally like what we would ideally like uh, simulation developers to internalize this into their tools, so that the the support for Combine and, and SetML is, is brought into the simulation tools themselves rather than added externally. Um, but in any case, um, this is what the, well, th this actually does a lot of things because this also checks the runs unit tests for the um, this, this Cobra Pi package. And at the bottom here, um, at the bo very bottom here is an example of how to automatically, programmatically create a GitHub issue. Another resource that we've created is we have a template GitHub repository for creating simulation tools. And in this, we've abstracted out. So rather than looking at specific examples, we have a template which can be used to construct a simulation tool. And this also has um, guidance for how to um, automatically submit simulation tools. Uh, one other thing I should mention is we do also have a tutorial online for creating simulation tools. And we have a, a snippet of an example here, again, for how to automatically create GitHub issues to post 
and simulation tools to the registry. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, it was overview, really cool. Um, you mentioned in between already um, PETAP. I think it would be really nice maybe to, to think of that as an alternative input, basically, so to extend towards parameter estimation. I think this would be uh, really helpful also for uh, for developers of these parameter estimation tools, basically, to have their uh, standardized test suite available. <laughs> So yeah, there's. I mean, we can discuss exactly how to um, to work with with PETA, but um, I think there's there's two major possibilities. One would be to use it as an alternative to SetML, and so in a combined archive, we would indicate that the PE tab is the is the code in the combined parlance that the PE tab file is the master file which defines the tasks that should be executed. That's probably the, the, the right way to do this now. Um, there is, I think, another possibility, which is to uh, expand SetML so that SetML could say, uh, to, could reference out to a, a PE tab file. So the SetML would be the master and then inside the SetML file, there could be description of parameter estimation tasks, which are defined with, with PE tab and some forward simulation tabs, tasks which are defined um, inside SetML itself. Yeah. So essentially I'm thinking that uh, just like how SetML references out the models and external files, um, SetML could potentially reference out to parameter estimation, which is defined in another external file in the same common archive. Well, that's an interesting idea. So I didn't think of that. I mean, I think uh, so. I'm, I mean, what can what can be done? What we already looked into is to obviously generate um, very basic simulation specification from p tab files of a, I mean, permit uh, and to essentially generate um, setml then from from p tab. But this is obviously only covering or using then a small spectrum of setml because setml is much much broader um, than that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the key thing here, here is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, stakeholders. And, and so um, we have to get buy-in from everyone who is related to this. Mm -hmm. So there are some ideas for how SetML might be expanded to embrace this. Um, at some future point, that might be possible, but it, it, that would probably take a while. Yeah. No, I think uh, referencing uh, PETAP from SetML would be a, a quite valid uh, uh, solution. I mean, it's really something, something else. I mean, one could. Yeah, I mean, it's in, in, and there's an, it's, not, it's not directly a simulation, obviously, but it's, uh, it's an execution of a more complex uh, setup, basically, this parameter estimation, which is specified in, uh, in PETAP. Well, I mean, as I've talked to some people, I think some people have. Have, seem to have a vision that SetML could function as sort of like a workflow language for modeling and that it need not be limited to forward simulation or parameter estimation. It could be kind of the glue that, that binds everything together. Um, of course, there's another, I think there's another possibility, which is to use a format which is more explicitly designed for workflows like the common workflow language. And then there could be a whole chain of events and SetML could, could be you know, potentially parts of that chain. Uh, PTAB could be another you know, part of that chain. Visualization and analysis that might be downstream of both of those could be another part of that workflow. Um, and if it was structured like that as a workflow, then um, a lot of those tools make it easy to, to say like, use this Docker image to execute this portion of the workflow and that there's no need to execute the whole workflow using any single tool. That's like the whole point is that you probably can't execute the whole workflow with one tool. You have to use a lot of different tools for that are specialized for different things. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, I think we should just, you know, brainstorm exactly what the right way to integrate um, uh, PE tab would be and how to do that given the current structure of SetML. Yeah, sounds good. But I, I think if we can do it, and especially if we can get some of the, the PE tab tools into a Docker format, then um, then we would be able to offer a web-based uh, way of executing those tools as well. So you, you Con could conceptually conceptually it shouldn't be a problem to to dockerize many of the tools for some it's 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 a bit of an issue i mean for instance matlab based tools and so on dockerization is obviously i don't have to tell you and for instance two of the current tools which are implemented so two of the eight tools implementing um p tab right now i think uh, yeah they are matlab based so they would have an issue but conceptually for the remaining six i I think this would be possible, although obviously, I mean, this is currently not done for the different tools, so it might be some some work to get that set up. So, um, regarding, I mean, licenses as far as executing simulations for the community on the web, um, so that would relate mostly to maybe Jan can answer this question: what licenses? would be available to us from Yukon's HPC system. I don't know if Jan is still here, but in principle, it is possible to run licensed software for the community. Yeah, I'm still here. And it, I mean, I know Yukon does it internally. Um, maybe Jan can comment on how much those licenses would permit us to offer this as a service to the broader community beyond Yukon. Which license is that? So the example is MATLAB, but this also comes up with Flux Balance, where uh, in particular like CPLEX or Kurobi might be desired. So if we manage, like the, the, the site license is, uh, well, unlimited users for it, for research is close to a quarter million per year. So, so I think that the question is, um, so you already have a site license. Um, so so the, would you the, be able to use that as, as we are currently, which is, so here we're, we're offering this really as like a service to external users beyond the University of Connecticut research correct and the there's a way we establish this for a lot of negotiation with with mathworks and for the nmr box project which is another p41 that offers a, a platform as a service in the vm format that there's two types of deployment in which you can talk back to a, a licensed server that you have or the end user has, or uh, via the commitment to be an academic user. So you collect that information from the user that they're an academic user. And because we have a site license and we've been a good customer, they allow us, which they normally don't do, to transfer that to a user of such a service considered as an as an affiliate, a collaborator. It's 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 pretty complicated, but we can do it. Well, we have to get the, the legal team got involved and they figured out a way to do it. I mean, I think the, the short answer is from a technical standpoint, it is definitely possible to manage licenses in conjunction with Docker, but it does have to be worked out for each individual simulation tool, mm -hmm. both from a licensing standpoint and at least as I've experienced, the, the implementation of the licenses is basically different for each software tool. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the problem. And for MATLAB is that, uh, so AutoCAD does a wonderful job of doing this properly. Um, MATLAB does not, but 
if you have an externally internet accessible FlexLM license server, uh, then that can be passed on to the container as a parameter. And then you can, there's, um, there's an environment variable that you're setting so that when the process is launched, it's, it looks to check out the license at the given space. So I think something similar to this could be done with Garobi. Cplex, I, I actually don't really know where the license is with Cplex. But I, I think in general, like IBM seems to be quite friendly to academic users. I would be surprised if we wouldn't be able to work something out. Cplex, when you install it, it actually, it just runs in, in that environment. But there are no further license checks afterwards. So I think they, they only checked it when you sort of get the installation file. Yeah, I mean, that, that's my, my experience, but I wasn't sure if there's some license file embedded when you download Cplex as an academic user. Like Groby is quite clear when, when you use Groby, you create a license file. And so we could do something similar to what Jan is describing where we allow users to enter a key for a license that they have for Groby. Yeah, I mean, as mentioned for our own tools, this wouldn't be too relevant, but I mean, there are quite a few tools where this actually plays a big role, I think in this, um, community focusing on parameter estimation and so on, there's quite a bit of work still done in MATLAB. And quite a few very good tools are actually available in MATLAB. So, um, yeah. so one other thing I, I we've mentioned before, but to, um, to emphasize again, is that um, we are trying to keep the barrier to submission of simulation tools as, as low as possible. And so, while we want the community to, to submit Docker images that are ideally free of, of commercial licenses that anybody could use, uh, we are open to accepting simulation tools for which there is no Docker image available. So we're happy to just accept the metadata about a simulation tool, which can still be useful. So we can still capture for like a MATLAB, you know, for a variety of reasons, you might not immediately want to create Docker images for every tool, partly because it takes time um, to map out all the other standards and part, partly because of license issues that need to get resolved. But even before that, we can quite quickly submit just metadata so that we can get them into the registry and then the community can use the biosimulators website to find tools that support particular parameter station methods or are available with specific interfaces. That can be done, I think, quite easily. And then the creation of the Docker images and the navigation of the licenses will definitely take more time. Any other questions? Well, we're coming up at three o'clock. So um, thank you very much for your, your time and joining us today. Um, I can stick around for a little bit more if there's any questions or, or things people would like to discuss with us. Otherwise, we hope we will see you tomorrow. Yeah, thanks for the session. Bye. See you tomorrow. Okay, Daniel already dropped out, which is a bit unfortunate because I hope that we could discuss in a bit more detail. But then I would suggest actually that we take a separate telephone conference on that. I mean, I already wrote the email, which you probably saw.
but uh, I think this would be extremely valuable to have this uh, type of uh, functionality validation and so on for the different for the different tools. Basically, in a centralized place, may not be a currently doing on a P tab side is really quite suboptimal. That uh, all the toolbox developer developers test themselves. We have a few standardized tests, but um, it's not. This is not really not really clean, basically. And um, yeah, this could be really helpful and make also everything much more accessible. So I, I would really uh, appreciate there if you could if you could kind of push this uh, push this together. And I mean on the, on the input side, how we integrated with ZML and so on. I know that this is quite a political topic, and I think actually also yeah. um, also changes in. That ML can take a while, at least from what I've heard. Um, so uh, I'm here happy with everything basically we can do on a ideally low level, basically, such that we don't create too many barriers, basically. So um, yeah, I mean, my advice for with set ML was, would be let's not work through with respect to T tab is let's not try to work through set ML. We'll, we'll use put uh, do you, uh, the PE tab tools, they already embrace the combine archive? I mean, it's just a zip folder, essentially. Yeah, exactly. So this is already embraced. This has already been added. So I mean, what we could what we could do is yeah, really just uh, essentially re replace there in some sense, um, set an L by PE tab. Obviously, it's, it's very different from the focus here. And it's really not a one or the other. But I think this would be quite, uh, I think this would be currently the way to go, essentially. So. Um, yeah, so yeah. everything that we have, um, I mean, if you go to the website, like obviously the, all the existing simulation tools use set ML, but, uh, but, but the software that we've developed really doesn't make any assumptions that you're using set yeah. ML. <clears throat> oh, no, that became quite clear. So whoever was detailed introduction was also quite, quite valuable. Um, I think yeah. we sit together and uh, I would have to bring in probably a PhD student from my group who's only sure. doing work basically to um, to push to push this thing thing forward um, to really sit down what the individual steps would be basically where we with what we can and have to do. I mean, obviously we we could start with um, generating generating a first example basically on our side. Obviously, things like um, the pipesto in combination with Amici, which would be like for us for standard pipeline for this fitting. It should be quite easy to dockerize, so that I don't have any concerns. Um, at least I, I don't come up with any more. <laughs> if you are asked by my, so <laughs> my coworkers, maybe they have some, but uh, I think as this is all Python and C++, this should be quite straightforward, basically, to go. So and then if you use that, have, Sorry, so to just to interject one thing. So in fact, we already have um, a Docker image for Amici. It yeah. doesn't execute parameter estimation, just to, does forward simulation with CVOAD. But this already provides some of the basic structure for the Docker image that we need, the command line program, and you know, and so on. Yeah, I, I was indeed aware of that. Um, but I believe this could be also then a corresponding starting starting point, basically. Um, yeah, uh, I, th I, I, th I think there is no at least from what I've seen now in the presentation, I think there is no technical limitation or so basically of a platform you develop or so um, or of our tools basically to set it up in this in this way. So I think one just has to do it essentially. So <laughs> which is a good good situation. Yeah, there's, there's probably, there may be a few small things here and there that we have to to generalize, but we have we've tried very carefully not to assume any particular format, mm -hmm. especially on the model side. Um, yeah, I mean, what one probably would have to discuss specifically is the output formats one, one assumes here. Um, I mean, we are already using um, HDF5 files as output formats, basically, of the pipeline. So this would quite naturally um, integrate, uh -huh. so at, least for, at least for, for PyPesto. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the so other ones probably don't. Exactly. <laughs> but the, the same is true, was true for simulation tools. I mean, none of them used HDF, they all use CSV. And, and so one of the problems was, for example, ZML has this notion of a repeated task, but no tool has a way of outputting the repeated task. So it's a, you know, ZML is a very funny thing, but. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I've also not found a very good um, editor for SETML files or so, so far, basically, where one can easily construct them. So this yeah. is this, this essentially hindered us. A, so when we were actually thinking about what to do, basically, I mean, our first, before we had PETAP, basically our first starting point, yeah, let's look at ZML basically and let's see how much this covers. And I mean, conceptually it covers a lot, but there are just no real, not so many tools which actually support it basically. And if already the construction of a ZML file is just, just creates a headache basically, I mean, you really don't want to do it. And uh, yeah. I wish, yeah. I wish you were all selected as a, a ZML editor because um he, he seems to share the same sentiment that i have is that it's just standard but of course like it's not really standard at all it's just yeah. very broken unfortunately yeah it's not so accessible this is this is quite unfortunate actually and i mean for for ZML, i mean also i mean uh, sorry for for spml obviously nobody looks on not so many persons look at the XML code, but there are really nice editors available, basically, and really a lot of tools to, to work with that. And this is more or less the way we have to go also for ZML. But uh, so the same holds actually true now for PTAP, because I mean, let's be honest, I mean, we all, one also has to dive into these TSV files to construct the uh, respective experiment definitions, which might be a bit more accessible, but not much than XML. But it would be really cool to just have an editor basically to construct these files in a very standard uh, and easy way. So for, yeah. for that, you, I mean, I would, one thing I would suggest is we created this, this thing that we called object tables to allow us to take a, a link set of tables and encode them into Excel. Um, it's still not, uh, and a, like a complete visual editor, but it does allow you to take advantage of a bunch of the features of Excel. So you can do things like lock the you know, headers, you can provide sort of like inline help through comments, you can have some degree of inline validation, table of contents, and then all this can be automatically parsed out into a data structure. I mean, we, I guess our, our thinking was that there are a lot of use cases where you, you want something that's that's more than just a text file, but at the same time, Excel is, it's hard to deny that Excel actually is quite useful in a lot of cases. And so for, for quite a few cases, I, I feel and like, quite a few, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, I feel like for your, for the use case of PE tab, like Excel actually is really useful. And creating an editor which somehow recreates the Excel experience, I think is hard. So we we're so like- So actually, this was also the design criterion for us for PTAP basically. So we want we wanted persons to be able to use something um, they also use on a very regular basis like uh, Excel or um, open alternatives basically to this. And essentially all files in um, PTAP, but um, the, uh, a uh, YAML file basically for binding things together can be edited, constructed in, in Excel basically or similar tools basically. So this was my intention, but obviously what we don't have is a, um, let's say an Excel based validator. I mean, there is a validator obviously for the for format and so on, but um, this is already far less accessible or only accessible to person, persons with some Python, uh, very basic Python uh, skill set basically. Yeah, so, so with object tables, we've, we've tried to wrap this up so that you can define a, a schema declaratively. And then um, we have provided a REST API that you can use to validate documents according to that schema. But it becomes very much from the same philosophy. We want people to use Excel because it's installed on like literally a billion computers. And everyone that you might imagine using PE tab like already knows and has Excel or something similar. But we wanted to provide like a little bit more polished user experience than what you would get just by opening up a, a collection of separate TSV files. Because if you open up separate TSV files, Excel won't really treat that as one workbook. Yeah, no, they're not. Yeah. Um, so object tables, kind of 
tries to make. In fact, we've structured object tables that if you want to store the, the data in TSV, that's fine. And then you can just use object tables to convert that into a uh, one Excel document. And because the the schema essentially is, is what's used to define all the formatting. So if you import all the, the TSV files into one um, Excel document, then the object tables will just apply the canonical formatting. Mm -hmm. And then you can like go the reverse and save it back out to TSV. So if you want to like save your documents into a repository and use the text-based nature of TSV to, to capture the changes, then like it's nice to store in TSV, but you want to edit it as an Excel document because Excel is a little bit prettier than TSV. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To be honest, I still didn't uh, check out objects tables, so I will definitely do so. Um, but what I also kind of imagine, but what we also didn't start to develop, is something where, where you where one can actually um, combine the definition of PTAB directly with a at least rudimentary visualization, basically of underlying of underlying data set. I think this would be quite useful to, for instance, check implementation errors basically that right conditions are used and things like that because this is what we mostly see going wrong if persons uh, have problems using ptab is that it's really about the linking of conditions and experimental data and this is just much more apparent basically from directly has it also as a corresponding visualization where you know, the simplest case time those responses um, are, are plotted basically i unfortunately have to drop out now <laughs> Sorry, it's getting a bit late from uh, late for me. Um, yeah, so I will speak again with uh, Daniel. I will um, find a PhD student you know, or postdoc in my group basically to work on this from from our side, and then uh, essentially we yeah, and I will simultaneously have a look myself at objects tables, and then probably in the next week or so we will get back to you basically how we can also pu push um, P tab. Um, support validation forward basically in that in that format if that's fine for you so daniel suggested that we meet on wednesday i think it has ah uh, yeah true in, in the con oh sorry i missed that yeah in the context of a p tab session anyhow that's that, that's good yeah I'll, I'll do that session, but um you know i'm sure you get other people coming too so we can always find a separate time because um, yeah. particularly the, the issue with sediment like uh we have to spend a little bit of time to decide exactly how to navigate that. Yeah. Yeah, but I think if we if we for a moment avoid it in some sense basically and just use PTAP, I think we, <laughs> yeah. um, we don't we don't have to decide it basically. Um, yes. But I think I, I personally think it would be really cool to have in the long run a consistent uh, solution basically. I mean there was already in ZML also years back with discussion about how to integrate parameter estimation and, and funny stories so um, about two years ago i was forwarded a google docs document basically on the um, the discussion basically of how to integrate parameter estimation in ZML basically and and i saw that i thought all oh, really cool and started editing comments and so on and uh, like an hour in i realized oh, then that document was from 2013. <laughs> And not, not so much on that parameter estimation topic happened since then. That was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, then, yeah, I will drop out now. And um, I would suggest regarding meeting on PTAP and so on, we follow what um, has been suggested by Daniel. Um, I'm not sure how many persons will really come to this PTAP session. It's a bit difficult to, to predict. I mean, there are some registrations now, but mostly of uh, names which already know about PTAP. So I think based on what I've seen, I guess it would be a quite detailed discussion and then this will also fit uh, very, very nicely into that. Yeah, I agree. But, Hard to know who will be there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot for all of you. This was really, really helpful. Um, the recordings will be shared afterwards or on, a, on a separate link? Or uh, yeah, we'll figure out some place to put them. Yeah. Okay. In the discussion in the end, we can cut off. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Then okay, have a nice evening or afternoon. <laughs>